that we're no longer on recess. We're back and we're back as sitting as the Board of Health. Um, and we're going to continue our um, coronavirus relief fund update with Mr. Madeline, Mr. Rich Madalena, Mr. Jerome Fletcher. And just for those who might have turned tuned in um, after the, uh, the meeting or the uh, first part of the meeting, we are deferring the briefing on the Inspector General's report until a future council meeting. We're not sure which one it will be yet, but it looks like it, it will be, it will not be today. We know that. And it will be at a future council meeting. But we're beginning this afternoon with a continuation of the update uh, as the Board of Health. And that's from Mr. Rich Madalino and Mr. Jerome Fletcher. Mr. Madalino, are you here? Yes, you are. There you are. And did you want to begin this or did you? I'll, I'll just briefly say um, thanks to Councilmember Friedson uh, pointing out our error. We've corrected that chart. We can have that shared with you um, individually and certainly moving forward, all of our documents about FEMA will show the right number. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. And then with that, just to keep things moving along, um, since I already did my introductory comments before, we'll turn it over to Jerome Fletcher to go over um, several of the business assistance programs that you've you've supported with special appropriations. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Rich. Um, good afternoon, Council President Katz, uh, Vice President Hucker, and the other uh, all other council members. Uh, thank you for this opportunity, um, Councilman Reamer. I just sent to you um, the email. Um, my apologies if I didn't you didn't get it the first time. I hope everyone has received the notes. I'll gently go through them so we can uh, save most of the time for the questions that you may have regarding where we are on the status of our business uh, programs, which we started providing relief for uh, back in April. Um, I won't go over the FEG program. I think everyone pretty much knows that it's closed at this time. The main thing to point out about the FEG program is that it is still under review, but it has been reviewed by the Office of the Inspector General. They have provided to us about five different recommendations for us to consider, implement, and be aware of going forward. I'm happy to say that most of those were already um, either in process, we were aware of them based on what lessons we learned uh, during our time of moving on from that program to other programs, but it was still helpful nonetheless. And we do always want to make sure that we do our, we conduct our programs and minister in the best way, best ways possible. So the reopening Montgomery uh, grant program is our uh, our most current program, and we've received over 4,000 applications, with 2,500 being selected in four different lotteries. Uh, of those 2,500, 1,100 of those uh, have provided documentation, and I think you're going to see a similar pattern here to what Amanda Harris referenced earlier regarding some of her grant program, which is the same thing for this group program. People haven't responded. Uh, we're making calls to people to try to get them on the phone, and we are doing a diff additional outreach so that we can make sure that people are aware of this particular program. We've actually um, approved uh, over 600 applications and nearly $2.2 million. And in order to increase that spending pace that I mentioned, you know, we continue to try to make improvements. And what we did was we did additional out outreach for direct emails to over 20,000 businesses. We've done press releases, we've done news stories, part of which was centered around how you can use the reopening grant program to winterize your particular um, business. Um, we do know and we have been aware, you know, part of our earlier conversation with Councilman Friedson was to point out that, you know, winter was coming and we needed to make sure that whether it was buying heaters and tents and, you know, we wanted to make sure that they knew that these items were available. While we do recognize and we have to be, you know, realistic that, you know, everyone winterizing <clears throat> and providing the outdoor experience will come to a point where it will be too cold for that to continue. But still, we wanted to make sure, <clears throat> excuse me, that we capture that opportunity here in the fall months as much as possible. Possible. And we've actually partnered with EDC's 3R program too, again, to make sure that we do as much advertising as we can. Um, the winterizing, the street eateries, um, the RSC directors, as well as the outdoor dining team. And the outdoor dining team is uh, composed of, of a multi-agency effort, including the county executive office, the DPS, DTS, and ABS, in order so that we can identify areas where we can actually have um, winterized eateries, eateries still available. And that's still ongoing and in motion as we speak. 
the tourism stabilization program um, that's in front of council um, right now and you know upon its approval we clearly understand that this was an effort on our behalf to help an industry that we felt and i think everyone will agree on is uh, one of the most hardest hit uh, from this pandemic and that is to say that they are hardest hit due to the the unemployment rate that is um, extremely high uh, for those particular in hospitality recreation um, culture and entertainment so we're at the point now where finding a financial relief outlet is is our main focus we do want to make sure that the right sort of public uh, non -pub, uh, public 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 um, facilities are being able to offset some of their operational losses during this time we do understand that this program like all of our other programs will not help every single person out who does need help from the particular um, county resources, but we are doing our best in order to identify the candidate pool of the $5 million that this program would be targeted towards to allow for some relief and recovery. <clears throat> Upon the approval of council, we will um, finalize, or should I say, do more um, detailing of the regulations that we will put in place that will allow for the grant to be administered. The grant will be administrated by the business advancement team led by Tina Benjamin. Uh, Lori Borrier, who is also um, very familiar with finance, will lead that program and will supplement them with staff as necessary. We don't have time in this particular effort in order to outsource this, so we really need to go ahead and make sure that we get the process and the details handled internally and get it rolling as soon as possible. They're already looking at how to make an easier process for the application process, not like some of the other ones that were lengthier. This will be a quicker grant process. And uh, according to Ms. Benjamin, it'll be like a tiered process, sort of like the arts um, program has been administered. So again, we're learning from our lessons. We're trying to make it easy, make it simple, knowing that we have you know less than 90 days here to get this money out the door. The Unemployment Outreach Initiative, and speaking with our um, current interim CEO work, uh, at Workforce Montgomery, Mr. Leonard Howie, um, he has provided information regarding saying that we are going to ramp that effort back up after we get past this current process of knowing, trying to figure out if the state is going to offer more unemployment benefits, how we can do the outreach to make sure that people are aware of those benefits, where to find those benefits, and answer questions as soon as possible. Uh, I do know that he's been working on this outreach effort for a while, and he started it with, uh, I think, we believe, Councilman Lemer back in the spring, but it is one where it is still going to be ultimately important because getting our unemployment rate back to a number that should be below 3.5% uh, is something that we will strive to do because that's where it was prior to the pandemic. Uh, the business assistance for medical and dental clinics, uh, this is the one that Councilmember Rice was referring to earlier. Uh, we worked with Council uh, Councilmember Albernos, thank you a lot, in the beginning of this process, and it was actually passed back in, uh, back in, I believe, in August. And on behalf of the county executive, uh, the executive staff still moved forward with identifying how we can administer this program. Uh, county, uh, excuse me, um, the Department of Finance Director Mike Covio has done a great job in leading us to where we are right now. They just executed their contract uh, yesterday with LEDC. LEDC will be the actual disbursement arm of this program. Uh, PCC, the um, Primary Care Coalition, will actually be one of the administrators knowing that we needed a subject matter expert in the field to help us with the rubric of the ranking so that we could then get those grants out the door. I believe they're in 50,000 for medical medical facilities and 25,000 for dental clinics um, tranches. And of course, if they receive something from the FEC program, there will be a cap on that. We do wanna make sure that we still continue to help those businesses who may receive FEC, um, FEC funding, but not to duplicate our funding efforts by um, no stretch of anyone's imagination. Um, as you can see, the, the week of, uh, October 26, uh, which is where we are right now, you know, we're reviewing the application structure, we're finalizing the contract with PCC and LADC is on board as well. Uh, next week, we are going to make sure that the draft application is complete so that we can get it out online as soon as possible. LEDC 
will begin to design their portal. And as well as all of these vendors working together, they will also work and keep included the county as well. The county presence is one that we want to make sure stays involved, not only because of the funding element, but because, again, of our lessons learned, what we have seen and what we should not be able to duplicate as uh, what we would call um, errors on grants that we have um, provided in the past. So the week of uh, November 2nd, um, seems to be a pretty strong week because we want to make sure that we finalize the application and the marketing plan and we do know based on council member um, nancy devaro's uh, primary um, influence that we have the outreach plan for our minority communities uh, or multiple languages included on our uh, communication information and making sure that we also find a way to reach those who are hardest to serve knowing that everyone is not either on internet or have that access, similar to what we've done with the reopening grant program and how uh, some of our county staff hand delivered flyers, we are going to have to make a very strong effort and push on this to increase our outreach to those who uh, need it the most. Um, I will go down to the opening, the LEDC applications looks to be on November 18th. And we actually wanna keep it open for 28 days, excuse me, for 10 days to November 28th. Uh, after the 10-day period, they will be reviewed, they will be ranked, we're going to reach out to the awardees, and they have to be selected, notified, and acknowledged by December 30th, and then we have time after December 30th to actually get the money out into their hands. Uh, but we will be making sure that we follow these deadlines quite timely, and as I can imagine, the council will, will want and need frequently frequent updates to make sure that we are on path to make sure that we don't run into any hurdles or um, roadblocks that would allow that from happening, knowing that time is of the essence. Um, I did speak about the Fed program already, and from the Economic Development Corporation standpoint, uh, I did put a note in here after speaking to Ben Wu, CEO at um, MCEDC, and his 3R initiative efforts, and they are ongoing, and they just kicked off and launched a new piece of that this week. But the most important piece of what the county is working on them with is this new state funding that was announced um, late last week. We did have a conversation yesterday with um, Commerce Secretary Schultz, and she gave some more information on the relief package. And while it seems like Montgomery County's portion will be roughly uh, $8 million. The governor feels that, you know, the restaurant relief is the greatest area of need right now. They are giving a very, very broad amount of latitude to the local jurisdictions on how to design a program or either add on to an existing program to get this money dispersed. And they have even offered their services to help those jurisdictions who may need it to get the money dispersed. Um, so the Montgomery County's government itself uh, has a lot of uh, flexibility in how we want to run that program. The biggest thing that the state said and what they required is to make sure that the demographics of the grantee are provided back to the state for their tracking purposes. This grant program, the funding has to be out the door by December 31st, not acknowledged, not assigned. It must be dispersed by December 31st. So. I said all that to say MCEDC has already stepped up to the plate. They have offered to be a willing partner, and of course, we would take them up on that. We don't have the details of what this program will look like yet, but we are working on it based on the limited time frame of the information when we received it, as well as the information of when it needs to get out the door. Um, I believe that was the end of my um, report that I sent. If anyone did not get that report, just please let me know, but I thought I sent it to everyone. My apologies for those who I may have missed, and I'm happy to answer any questions today and follow up with those who, that I cannot answer at this current time. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I did receive the report uh, afterwards, so thank you. Yes, um, wherever it was in cyberspace, you found it for me. <laughs> Council Member Friedson. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Mr. Fletcher. Uh, uh, for those who don't know, Mr. Fletcher and I were on a, another meeting in between uh, our previous council session and this council session talk, talking specifically about some of these very same uh, programs. So I apologize to you, Mr. Fletcher, for how much face time you're required uh, to have with me uh, today and, and many days. Um, a few questions on this. I appreciate the report and, and the update on this. I, I don't need to you know, reiterate how important this is for all of us, given how much uh, challenge there is in our economy with so many of our local businesses. These uh, efforts are so critical, and I appreciate 
uh, the update on them. And I think we need to, you know, keep uh, making sure that all of us are on the same page of where these programs stand. I did have a couple quick questions. Uh, start with the reopening uh, grants. Appreciate the move. I've been working very closely with uh, you and Ms. Benjamin and others, uh, Ms. Stevenson uh, in county government uh, on this. Uh, obviously, I would like to see more of the money going out, more folks uh, applying that we share that uh, concern and interest. I appreciate that uh, with uh, some urging, uh, it has increased from the 500 originally to 750 uh, of the number of applicants uh, at each lottery. Um, you mentioned here, and, and we've been pushing for this, uh, that all uh, uh, that there be a, a special focus on those who have not been selected to provide them the opportunity uh, to be able to provide the documentation uh, necessary. Um, just wanted to get a sense how many of those will be done and, and how, how long will it take for every applicant who has not yet had a chance uh, to be selected to get selected based on the, the current lottery. Uh, and, and thank you, Councilman Friedson. So the, the answer to the question is, what we have done is we sort of made some improvements that we, as we've gone along, which were some were pointed out earlier rather than later, but we have enlisted some of the, the on-paid leave administrative staff that is still within the county government to actually make some of those outreach efforts to those people who have been selected and have not replied. What we were doing before is we were putting them right back into the candidate pool, which would allow them potentially to be selected twice. That process has stopped and we are putting them to the side and allowing our outreach just to continue to those actual individuals. Knowing that we selected over 2,500 and at this point, you know, more than half of those people have not responded, we are, we are making sure that we ramp up those efforts. So to answer your question, I would say that several hundred of those people are being contacted each week and mostly during uh, what I would say is um, more than not uh, during early parts of the week to make sure that we reach them. The second thing I'll say is that the ability to take those people and not put them back into the pool will increase the frequency of those who have not been selected yet. The, the good news is that we still have more money right now for everyone who is in that pool who properly qualifies. Now, and let me be clear, everyone who is in that pool, some of them have don't properly qualify if they don't have the receipts that they bought or if they don't meet the very, what I thought was very flexible um, guidelines to participate in that process. But everyone who is in that candidate pool at this time, we have enough funding for to make sure that they are selected and reimbursed. The average of reimbursement right now is $3,400. I believe people can get up to $5,000. So that tells us that, you know, we're above and beyond as it goes for money that's available. And there's no way we could spend all of the $14 million that was allocated for that process, therefore allowing us to have money to repurpose if council so approves for the hospitality and tourism um, stabilization package. Appreciate that. So when and how frequently are the lotteries currently being conducted, the 750 applicants being polled? So the four that have been conducted have been on approximately every other week basis. And we just had one, our fourth one that was pulled. So I believe we either scheduled to do one at the end of this week or early next week. Okay. So based on the numbers that you've given, there's 1,623 uh, applicants in the pool uh, that have not been selected yet. Correct. So that would mean that it would take them a little over two lotteries to be selected? That sounds about right. Is it possible to make sure that within the you know two lotteries that every single uh, applicant that has not been selected would be selected so that you can tell folks as of October 30th, if you've applied, you will have a chance at these funds by X date and have a date certain for when that second lottery is going to be? Uh, I can certainly reach back out to the team. I don't think that that's an unreasonable request, especially considering how long it's been open and uh, the steps that we've taken to get this far. A little bit of acceleration should be um, should be welcome. If you get back to me on that, I'd appreciate it. I think you and I both know that one of the complaints and concerns is folks who applied for this in the very beginning who have yet to be selected or frustrated while at the same time the county is doing all that it can to advertise how much money is left in this account you can imagine for a business that's that's struggling and i know you know this because you're hearing from the same folks uh, that i have and so i think providing some level of certainty and a process that has been uncertain for them would be uh, extremely 
uh, helpful. And so I, I would appreciate that. Um, yes. Thank you for that. Mo moving on to the, the state funds. It's very encouraging, the state uh, program. I, I think we all agree it could have been more, but appreciate that it, it is uh, not insignificant. $250 million will certainly uh, help the fact that the county uh, directly uh, as a pass through uh, to our local businesses could be getting uh, approximately 8 million as you've shared with us today. And I had heard uh, over the weekend is uh, you know significant to buttress our efforts significantly that we've already done um, and, and continue to do. Um, appreciate that MCEDC and Ben Wu specifically is involved in this given his background at the state. I think that's very uh, helpful in the relationships uh, there with his former role at Commerce. I just want to get the sense um, who is deciding how this is going to work? The state has given significant amount of flexibility for how these funds are used. The county executive has shared that there's some interest in maybe using an existing program or might need to create a new one. Uh, that has to be decided. Uh, who is deciding that? When is that being decided? What is the process? And what involvement, if any, will the council have uh, in that? Well, I would say that the information as we have gotten in, we've sort of shared it kind of broadly and publicly. Well, I know at least the information I've received, I would say that we are working and we will meet internally, one, to come up with a proposal that I think that would we would all benefit by including council in that process. And I'm sorry, was that question for me or Mr. Mr. Madalino, the CAO? Well, well, it, yeah. Either, either, both, right. at the end. Uh, right, I'm sorry, Rich, Let me, I'll finish and then if you want to. Correct me when I'm wrong, that's fine. Um, you know, if we have the internal conversations and then are able to put together a proposal of what we think, we can use that in a similar model as to what we've done in some of the other programs where we sort of communicated with council so that we can um, get on a similar path. Maybe not the same path because there's a lot of different ideas and there's only one way or there's a limited way to administer programs. But I think that, as, you know, getting um, everyone together to include um, thoughts, ideas, Lessons learned is the best way to go. And Rich, I'm sorry, I apologize. So the governor's the governor's letter to us says we're going to receive approximately eight million two hundred thirty thousand dollars, and that they will be providing specific guidelines how they are to be dispersed. Um, it the letter to us um, had a link for um, you know click here for guidance, and they have yet to update. Um, any of their guidance, all, all of the all of the links have not been populated with guidance as to how we're supposed to use the money because they are they are very um, they are very specific in saying in their letter um, that uh, the state will provide clear guidelines that jurisdictions must follow to disperse the funds. As soon as we get those guidelines, we'll be happy to share them with you. And uh, based on how this is working, I presume that the council will have to approve the appropriation of the funds. That that um, was one of the questions that I wrote down as a follow up before you even asked it. Okay, well, sounds good. I appreciate that. Uh, keep us posted on that. Obviously, all of us are very interested in how these funds will be uh, deployed. And I know that we all would want to be uh, involved formally or informally, depending on the process and uh, determining uh, how this uh, works and, and dovetails with all the other uh, efforts that we have uh, undertaken uh, up to this point. Uh, you know, there's a number of other uh, allocations here in the governor's $250 million package, some of which, most of which comes directly from the state. Uh, only one of them, by my count, is clear on exactly how it's going to work. It's just going to pick up the applications that couldn't be fulfilled way back when in the early part of uh, the pandemic, and they will honor uh, up to the point at which they can. Uh, the rest of them, it's unclear what the arts and entertainment and some of the other uh, uh, some of the other funds. So I presume we're also going to get information uh, on on those that the, the clarity hasn't completely come into full uh, picture uh, from the state. I just wanted to get a sense uh, who is the point uh, person on that uh, with respect to the executive branch uh, for us uh, to understand how that that is working. What is the communication strategy to our local business uh, community and, and partners to uh, uh, access uh, those funds? Uh, and um, will we have a person in county government or an email and phone number or some area where uh, local businesses can be directed to to say, you know, here are the available funds here. Some are county, some are state. 
uh, that you can access. Here are the rules to, to help navigate them through that. So certainly on, on our relationship with the state and all of the, uh, the, the, the work in connecting with either the governor's office or the Department of Commerce, Melanie takes, Melanie Wenger with the Office of Intergovernmental Relations takes the lead. She's been part of all of our um, communications. Uh, then Jerome is um, spearheading all the, the efforts within the administration on the business assistance um, side uh, um, because, uh, because of the limited time frame like the, the, that the state is providing us. For example, these restaurant dollars have to be out the door <laughs> by, by the end of, of December because obviously the state is repurposing, I think some of its CRF dollars clearly. Uh, we will, um, you, you raise an excellent point about having one public um, ombudsman type person to answer all of those questions. I don't wanna put it um, directly on Jerome at the moment, but um, he and I will talk about that and get you a specific answer um, for for sort of who is that going to be that person recognizing some of these assistance programs have to be out the door by December 30th. Some of them are, are ongoing assistance programs and some of them are the special ones that we've created um, specifically for this situation. I appreciate that. I think that would be extraordinarily helpful. Communication has been a big challenge uh, throughout this uh, pandemic and I think that would help the council to have that and it would help the, the public. It would help uh, our partners in the business community, within the business community and the local businesses themselves. So I think that would be uh, very much uh, appreciated. So look forward to uh, hearing back on that. And the last thing that I wanna say with regard to this, you know, the executive branch has done an admirable job of setting up these economic recovery working groups uh, that hit all of the key sectors in the economy. And mm -hmm. I think that this is an opportunity to solicit their help and support uh, and also their feedback on a fairly quick turnaround uh, with how we deploy uh, these funds and their help in getting the word out uh, in order to deploy uh, the funds. I've participated in uh, virtually all of those uh, working groups and I think that they have some uh, very broad representation from uh, you know, demographically throughout the county, geographically, et cetera. And I think it would be a good uh, mechanism in order to uh, reach uh, a broad group uh, of people as broad and as wide as we possibly can, which obviously is the goal that, uh, that, that we all have. So the last thing that I will say on the uh, state grants, there has been an indication that we may just add on to existing programs. And while I'm not opposed to that, I just wanna be very careful that we have advertised certain of these programs, some of which I wrote. And so I understand the, uh, restrictions and some folks didn't apply for the reason that they weren't eligible at the time and I would hate to you know, doubly uh, limit and restrict certain uh, organizations and certain people so I'm not saying that we can't do that that we shouldn't do that but we just need to be sensitive uh, to how these uh, uh, programs were, were uh, communicated and what the original rules were to make sure that we're not uh, leaving folks out of this uh, significant supplemental uh, funding from the state. Thank you very much. That's all the questions I have, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Member Rice. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Fletcher. And so I've had an opportunity to reread uh, the grant that we passed on July 21st. Um, so it wasn't August, it was July. So we're talking three months. And part of that included, part of that 3 million included $500,000 as a special appropriation used by DHHS to continue to support the work of Montgomery Cares community clinics and their work with county residents who live in neighborhoods and communities disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. Um, I saw on the most recent report that I'm referring to that you guys sent us that as of October 22nd, total spent and encumbered is zero dollars. So are we saying that that half a million dollars that was supposed to go to DHHS uh, that was supposed to help to support uh, entities in our communities, primarily of color and lower socio socioeconomic status um, in areas that were heavily hit by COVID has not flowed yet. Good afternoon. So that portion of that grant was administered by DHHSS and DHSSS, and they have not given me an update on their spending of that $500,000. And I don't think they're on this call. So happy to give that and get it back to you, sir. Okay, 
Uh, and then with regards to the other one, why is it taking three months for us to get this? This was this was urgent. I mean, this is something in which, look, it was Council Member Juwando, and I know it's not you particularly, Mr. Fletcher, so please don't take this as you. It's just that, you know, you're the one who's answering the question. And so what I'm trying to understand is why it's taken so long for something that we dictated back in July, three months ago, over three months ago, three months and six days ago, was a huge priority for us in terms of standing up these uh, physicians in our areas so that folks could get checkups, so that folks could get, and this is before we had stood up uh, the testing model. And even still, you heard from Council Member Reamer, well, maybe I, I don't know if you were on the call earlier today, but the story from Council Member Reamer in which he was going to a private clinician to get testing, then decided well, because the line was too long and he, he didn't have that time to wait, that he ended up going to a county facility, mm -hmm. right? Somebody else may not have that flexibility to be able to go back and forth. They're riding two and three buses to get to this particular place. And so these are the challenges that our community is facing and we're continuing to languish in terms of providing the resources that are necessary to stand up our physicians in our communities, mainly in our communities of color. So why is it taking so long? And I have a feeling I know what the answer is going to be, but it's important to hear. Why is it taking so long for us to get this done and get this money to something that we know we all agree? I know you agree. I know the county executive agrees. I know DHX agrees is a priority. Why is it taking so long? So when that money was passed for this particular medical and dental grant program, we had conversations prior to it even being passed. This administration expressed its concern about the capacity to administer that grant program. We did not have an administration actually identify when that money was passed. Our finance director, Mike Covey, has worked very hard in order to get us to the point that we are right now of actually having an administrator on board to get this money out the door. I don't think any of us, as you said, would, den would deny the need but at the same time, we have been using all of our staff as well as paid contractors to administer multiple grant processes at this time. We expressed the need for an administrator at the time that it was passed, even before so, and now we are at the point of being able to move forward. So it takes three months to get an administrator? It, it I is. Mean, we, we've, administered, we've administered other programs and gotten those out the door. We did it with FEG. I mean, there, there are, I mean, so again, it, we, it just, to, to, me it's, it's though, it, to me, it seems as though it's just not as much of a priority because we didn't put more behind it and kind of left it to languish. And because nobody was saying, and again, we didn't have the list, right? So once we got the list and we were talking about this, and thank you, Councilmember Navarro, for getting us to have these regular updates so that we could then start asking questions about the status. We assume, well, I shouldn't speak for my colleagues. I assume all of this stuff was just rolling and that folks knew, hey, we're allocating this money. It's going to happen. And I know it's just one piece. And there are so many things that you guys have done well. But this one is so important. Just please do understand how important this is. And I remember when I had the conversation about this coming before us, and I gave the example of Liliana Cuervo, who's in Montgomery Village, who's a dentist who serves primarily people of color, including my children, right? But serves primarily low-income children in the Montgomery Village area, mainly Latinx, and about how she was struggling to try and make sure that she could still outreach to the community, let them know how it's still safe, how it's still important to do these things. We had these conversations in HHS committee and as full council. That's the reason why I, I just hope that you understand that my frustration, again, while I understand where you're coming from in terms of the explanation, it's not enough. We've got to do better. And this is one of the ones where I think we've dropped the ball. And I'm, and, and I'm just going to say, it. look, and you guys have done a great job with some of the other things, but this is one clearly in my eyes in which you dropped the ball. We've got to get on this right away. And so all I'm asking you from this point on, because we can't cry over spill milk, it's done. It is what it is. We have a false surge that is upon us right now. I asked Dr. Gales, he's going to be giving us numbers in terms of who this is impacting, both demographically and geographically. Uh, and so we'll have that data. We have got to get this money out to the physicians in these neighborhoods right now as we're seeing these numbers spike. Um, so that's that's just my piece, and I'll just leave it there. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilmember Reamer. 
Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Ms. Fletcher, you wanted to reply. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I just want to say I just want to say that, you know, I understand from your perspective and where you're coming from and the role that you played in, you know, the the money <clears throat> and the need for the county and the community. We totally agree with you on that. No one's going to deny that at all. But please don't mistake a, a, a lack of speed as a lack of priority. Again, you know, this is one of multiple grant programs that we were offering, one that we raised our hand on very early that we did not have the in-house capacity in order to administer it. And it, yes, has taken us this long in order to get to the point of finding an administrator. And as I outlined in my talking points, we do have a timeline that is going to allow us to get this money out the door by the end of the year, which is necessary in order to meet the requirements of the funding. So, 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 Mr. Fletcher, let me just be very clear. Funding by the end of the year is not in time for the pandemic spike that we're in right now. So let me just be very clear about that. Second, when it comes to uh, it being a priority, again, what should have happened, and again, we're Monday morning quarterbacking right now, but what should have happened is in August, you should have come to us and said, we're still having problems getting an administrator and let the council know, hey, we're still struggling with this. If you needed additional help from us, if you needed help from uh, private to help to be a part of it, you should have done it in August, you should have done it in September, and you should have done it before now, before October 27th. And I never saw anything. Now, if you I'm, transmitted I'm, something, I'd love to see it. Well, I'm not saying it was transmitted to you, but I can tell you that there were conversations with people on council regarding this program. So don't think that we didn't do it just because you didn't see it, council member. Well, anything that's transmitted, let me just correct you on something here. Anything that's transmitted to the, to the council, that's a formal transmission of information should go to the council president, which then goes to all of my colleagues. We should not be picking and choosing. No, no, we, let me just be very, I've been on this council a long time. So let me just tell you about what our policies should be. Um, and, and very clear, if you're communicating something to the council in terms of something that the county executive side cannot do, it needs to go through the council president that then would be transferred to all council members so that we're all aware. Because keep in mind, as we do these resolutions and pass them as a full council, regardless of whether I'm chair of HHS or chair of education and culture, chair of government operations, at that point, it belongs to the body. And so the president who represents us should then be able to get that and then disseminate that to us. So I, I just want to be very clear. We can leave it there. But let me just tell you that from my perspective, my expectation is from now on, so let me be very clear moving forward, anything that you have that's got my name attached to it, that is county council, uh, should be transmitted to me as well. So that's my expectation. So I, I, the resolution that you passed in June that authorized the large, the $80 million included a requirement that we submit a weekly report about the status of all the special appropriations. We have been doing that the, it has gone to Ms. Michelson and Mr. Howard um, every week. I think it. I think it is moved to a biweekly basis. So, uh, I, if if Councilmember Wright, Mr. Madalino, please don't please don't uh, make this like uh, you don't know what else you need to do. What I was asking you specifically is to make sure well, that if you have challenges, you transmit that to me. I'm not talking about an empty spreadsheet that says zero because just like I asked right now. I don't even have status on the half a million dollars that was supposed to go to something internal, DHHS, to help stand up primary care coalition. So you don't even have the status on that. So again, to talk to me about what you're currently doing still is inadequate. I, I'm just trying to say for the for the record for other people that there there was a regular report on information about I'm, 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 I'm you aware may find of that it completely Mr. unsatisfactory. And we will we will endeavor to, to fix that. I know on this one, um, this th this one appropriation, and the lessons learned from the PHEG program and what we could and could not do, um, the decision was to to find an outside partner to administer the program, and that took an extraordinarily long period of time to find someone who was willing to administer this program. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Reamer. Thank you. Uh, I'll try to be brief. I know we have to turn our attention to the subdivision staging policy this afternoon. We've got a long afternoon ahead of us. Um, uh, to to continue on the general topic of you know administration, um, I have uh, on the positive side. I've heard very good reports about the MTEDC's uh, 3R program, which came out of the business recovery group that I convened with Council President Katz. 
uh, along with a number of other initiatives. Uh, I understand they've been able to turn their grants around very quickly. Um, <clears throat> so that is uh, a bright spot here. Um, it is, you know, it is a little, I, I can understand the frustration of businesses that are waiting in the reopen pool and are not, uh, you know, they're, they're just waiting and waiting while the council, uh, the county sort of continues reaching out to other businesses that are not responsive. Um, you know, that's got to be frustrating. So, uh, I, you know, anything we can do to accelerate that, um, you know, so we can get those grants out. Uh, I just wanted to get a little clarification on the WorkSource Montgomery uh, piece there, please. Um, can you just explain again, Mr. Fletcher, what uh, I was under the impression that WorkSource Montgomery was moving forward with education. You know, we 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 had the forty thousand dollar grant set aside, which was intended. It was you now it could have been a down payment on a bigger program, uh, but there's been so much turmoil at the organization. I don't think that that really has been realistic. But in any event, um, uh, I'm a little unclear about just the report that that you provided there. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Councilman Reimer. And yes, to your first point, yes, we will make sure that we are. Still, always trying to make sure that we get that money out fast as possible with the reopening grant program, and the the the, the tidbit that you saw, excuse me, the um the note that you saw in my talking points that came directly from uh, WorkSource Montgomery, and I I don't want it to sound like they're they haven't done anything up until this point, but you remember back when the unemployment initiative was um, front and center based on the extra amount that the state was allowing. Leonard, excuse me, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Howie did move forward with outreach that he was doing. He just didn't necessarily charge it to that particular program. So the effort and the outreach had begun on the first part, and then of course the amount of money. And his effort right now, as it talks about the forty thousand dollars, is more in line with, you know, as soon as it gets going back again, I'm going to restart my effort again. So he hasn't really, I don't think, tapped into the $40,000. And, you know, I could be wrong, but I don't believe he's tapped into the $40,000 for the unemployment initiative. But that doesn't mean he hasn't done anything as well. Well, if you could please reach out, because if he, the note implies that maybe you'll, that WorkSource will be waiting for a new f federal action. But that would not be consistent with the CARES timeline, I think. So, yeah. And we all, like we all, you and I and some others have a meeting with him tomorrow, and that's on the probably agenda of things to discuss with Mr. Howard. Sure. And, and they've been providing a lot of constituent support mm -hmm. around unemployment. That uh, is correct. Which has been very helpful in that regard. Um, that is correct. But, uh, okay, well, um, you know, it's disappointing that the contract wasn't executed, that a bigger program wasn't executed uh, when there was a $600 supplement out there, there still are a number of people who are needing assistance getting their benefits. We're still hearing from people regularly. Uh, so there, there is a continuing need there. So uh, let's, let's make sure we pick up that ball and uh, we'll continue this conversation at EC Fed tomorrow. Understood. Yes, sir. Thank you, Council Member Albernaz. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to publicly thank um, Ms. Marla Bilonik, uh, Bilonik uh, from the Latino Economic Development Corporation and Ms. Leslie Grant from the Primary Care Coalition for stepping forward to agree to both serve as the fiscal agent, but also uh, the administrator to contract the funding for the various medical practices. And I do think now that we have a better sense of challenges in all areas as there, hopefully, fingers crossed, will be another round of federal stimulus, um, we can be more proactive in identifying potential fiscal agents, not just in this specific category, but in others, um, so that we don't have to, you know, <laughs> be, be reactive, um, as, as we've had to be, in part because of the pandemic, in part because of everything that we've been going through. But that way, there's a list of organizations that we may be able to reach out to as another tranche of funding becomes available. Because understandably, um, you know, we had been hearing the reports about finance and the challenges that they had, um, and those are not going to go away. Uh, and so, you know, we're, we're tapping contractors, we're reassigning staff members from other departments to help fill in. 
Um, and as we said at the last session last month, that's not sustainable. Uh, and so I do think that to the degree to which we can proactively reach out to these potential fiscal agents and partners would be helpful. Um, and then proactively finding out what they need in order to put them in the best position to be able to assist moving forward. So um, I, I'm, I assume we're, we're looking into that, but it's just a general uh, recommendation and we will follow up directly with DHHS on the $500,000 to the primary care clinics because it is, of course, uh, disappointing to say the least to hear at least those tranche of funding haven't gone out because those are those specifically intended for organizations that already have contracts with the county. Um, and so it should not have been as difficult as it was to secure a fiscal agent for those funds as it would have been for organizations we are that are already partners um, and that do need additional assistance right now. So we will follow up on that um, as my good friend and fellow HHS committee member uh, stated, Council Member Rice. So uh, thank you, Mr. President. I yield back to you. Thank you, Council Member Glaze. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Mr. Fletcher, I just want to go back to uh, some of the comments that my colleagues made and, and just make sure I understand it. Um, you know, there are a lot of people who are still waiting for this lottery uh, and are constantly contacting me, and I know they're contacting uh, my colleagues, everybody, uh, wondering. And so wh what what is the point in time in which the efforts to try and secure information from those who have been selected but have not given their information for whatever reason, and I know people are, business owners are incredibly busy uh, mm -hmm. on a multitude of levels right now, but at what point do we uh, stop trying to get that information to process their claim uh, and then turn it over to other people who are actively waiting with papers ready in their hand or electronically? So thank you, Councilmember Glass. We actually started that process about two weeks ago when we were still reaching out to people that we did recognize they were not being responsible for, for whatever reason, like you said, you know, you know, not pointing the finger at them for sure. But we had to kind of redirect our efforts into those who we knew were still in that waiting pool. That's why when Councilman Friedson says, hey, can you make sure and tell me when, how long it's going to take to reach out to all of them, they are our primary focus right now. We are giving them all of our attention. We haven't discarded those who have been selected for an award and haven't responded, but they will have. we will have to come back to them at a later date as we get through all of the applications. There's nothing wrong with coming back to them at the end, but our focus has to be on those who have never been selected and have still been waiting patiently. No, and, and um, uh, I, I appreciate all the efforts and leadership that Councilmember Friedson has has exhibited in, 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 this, uh, in this effort, in this endeavor, uh, yeah. but but it, it does concern me when when people are waiting in the queue and, and not participating uh, and they're holding up the line for people uh, who are who want to participate and are begging us to allow them to participate. So uh, I, I appreciate you sharing that uh, that you've begun this process of, of filling out the, the line uh, yeah. two weeks ago. And, and is that the, the the numbers that you were referencing, saying that it should all be set by the end of November or? Right, yes, sir. And I'm gonna solidify that date with our team, but yes, that should be, that should definitely not an unreasonable goal at all. And hopefully it'll be before then to be honest with you, um, because on, you know, the county executive has expressed the same concern that we're hearing in this room, you know, get the money out. What are you doing? Do it faster. So staff has reacted and I'm gonna get a date for uh, you, Councilman Friesen and the others as soon as I can. And then uh, la last question I have, you know, this, this is a parallel conversation in some respects towards the, with regard to the, the rental assistance, right? That, that people applied and then uh, either they, they were ineligible or they didn't produce the paperwork. Um, so with regard to this particular program, uh, what is the percentage of people who, who aren't eligible, but they applied? You know, just trying to figure out what that gap, why, why people are stuck in this queue. Well, I... I don't have to break out exactly how Amanda had hers. What I do know is that 58% of the people who were selected have been non-responsive in some shape, form, or fashion. We only have like a 42% rate of those who are actually communicating back with us and us, and we're able to get the money in their hands. Is, so, so to better understand this, because again, just like rental assistance, we know the need is there. Correct. It is undeniable. And, and in 
engaging in this conversation, we are not minimizing uh, the personal and professional hurt that people are experiencing, but we're just Correct. trying to make government work and Correct. trying to help yeah. those who are demanding it at this point in time. So that 58%, does it break down into sectors? Are they sole proprietors? Do you, do you have any insight into that? Um, I can get that for you. Let me get back to our team who works on it on a more daily basis, um, and I'll include it back in the information we submit back to council. Yeah, and, and I'll just close on this comment that I think that type of, of, of information is really important because if you're talking about a sole proprietor um, who is also managing a family and doing everything themselves, I, I can understand why, mm -hmm. why there's a lag because they're busy and they're prioritized right. health and family and other things. But if we're talking about other types of businesses with more professional staff or this or that, um, I, I do think that information would be helpful. So I, I look forward to, uh, I appreciate you uh, including it in your next report, um, and, and thank you for all that you're doing. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Madalino, Mr. Fletcher, do you have anything else to add for today? Not on my end. Thank you for the opportunity. I don't think so, but we appreciate this, and we'll be getting back to you. It's set up a um, – I'll be having a call with uh, Mr. Howard later to go over – the, some of the follow-up issues and institute a more um, formal process and hopefully get stuff back to you um, in writing before the next meeting. Thank you all very much, and thank you for all that you're doing. We're now going to no longer be under the Board of Thank you, Drew. We're no longer going to be under the Board of Health. We're going back to the regular council. And might I add, we're right on schedule. I know that it's rare that happens, but I wanted to just point that out because it might be the only time during the day that that actually has happened and will happen. Okay, so we're now going for a work session on the uh, subdivision staging policy, 2020-2024. Um, Ms. Dunn had sent us an email, uh, and Dr. Orlin, I know you're going to be included in this as well. Um, Mr. Uh, uh, Council Member Reamer, did you want to lead this off, or are we going to go right to Ms. Dunn? Well, I think we can go right to Ms. Dunn, but today I, I think we should be able to get through, I hope, the moratorium issue uh, and, and possibly even into the, um, uh, the UPPs. Um, and uh, so this is a very consequential uh, discussion today, and the uh, staff has laid out a good, great packet. We do not need to return to the impact tax issue, as, as Pam's going to say, but that can be at our next discussion. Uh, you know, we had had that last discussion. There's still, I think, information that we're all receiving and need to absorb. So, uh, you know, not, not just we can set that aside for today. We've got a big topic ahead of us. Thank you, Mr. Casparazzi. Thank you. Is that now, just as an aside, and I believe everyone remembers this, but we do have a possible uh, council session on this topic on Friday, if it's needed. So if we can't, we're trying our best to, to meet guidelines, to meet uh, timelines. So with that, Ms. Dunn, please begin. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Um, we're going to start in the staff report. We're actually going to be on, um, we not uh, alphabetized the items, so we're actually on letter C. And it's the annual school test guidelines and utilization report. Um, and it's a recommendation from the planning board um, to, it's recommendation um, 4.3, would require the planning board to adopt a set of annual school test guidelines by January 1st of 2021. And the guidelines um, would have to outline the methodologies used to conduct the annual school test and to evaluate the enrollment impacts of development applications and master plans. Um, subdivision staging policy has always provided that the planning board not only review and approve the annual school test results, but it also approves the procedures that are used to conduct that test. So the annual school test guidelines we provide a transparent reference manual um, for documenting how that test is conducted and how it's utilized. Um, the committee recommendation for this was three to zero in support of this um, annual school test guidelines. Okay. If we want to do straw votes as we go, is that what you're? That would, that would be great. It'll help okay. us from having to revisit any of this. I, I see no comments, which is usually a good sign that we're, uh, all okay with this one. Is that correct? Okay. You'll jump up and council members, you will jump up and down if you're, if there's a disagreement with what I'm saying. Uh, uh, you're not, 
some people just jumped up and down just for the fun of it. That's good. <laughs> when they show that he can still jump rope, okay, that then we are we are fine with that one. Thanks. Without objection. Without objection. Thank you. Um, so in addition to the annual school test guidelines, the planning board has also proposed what's called a utilization report. And this utilization report would accompany the annual school test results. So it would be something that is produced and is provided to the council and to the public in July of each year with the annual school test. And the report would include historical and projected countywide utilization rates by school level um, and the share of the number of schools at each of the levels that fall into different utilization categories. Um, and again, uh, the committee was 3-0 in support of this utilization report to accompany the annual school test. Okay, Council Member Reamer. So just to restate it, we will get an annual report about school, school utilization, as well as a detailed report about how they divide, how, you know, how they produce that report, how they analyze school capacity. That'll be very useful for everybody out in the community to be able to kind of get underneath the, the, the hood, so to speak, and, and get a better understanding of how school capacity is being planned out for a particular school and for the whole system. Okay, without objection. Without objection. Thank you. Next, Great. please. Okay, um, we're moving on. Um, we're on recommendation 4.8. And the purpose of this recommendation was to expand the content of the utilization report. And it would conclude, the proposal was to include data on facility condition information. And this, this piece of this recommendation really connects to one of the recommendations um, related to impact taxes, which would have allowed um, for non-capacity adding improvements um, to be credited against the impact tax. Um, and when the GEO committee took this up and they reviewed it, um, they unanimously did not support having non-capacity adding items as something that a developer could provide instead of capacity. Um, and so there really isn't a need to require that the planning department, the planning board, um, create a, another report which documents facility condition. Now, in allowing them to have the ability to create these annual school test guidelines, the board can place in those guidelines anything that they want. And if they want to report on condition, um, they can create that in their guidelines. With this recommendation, by not retaining it, it just simply says the SSP would not require a report on condition. And I think that's appropriate given um, the GEO committee's decision on not to support non-capacity adding credits. I just wanted to speak up for the Fed committee. We talked about the issue and we also expressed a lot of reservations about the idea of allowing, you know, one school to get a particular benefit as a result of development that other schools weren't going to get. That was kind of the underlying concern about allowing this kind of non-capacity improvement. Uh, but we understood that the GEO committee would actually take it up and so we waited to hear from the GEO committee. Council Member Navarro from the GEO committee. <laughs> I'm very glad that we seem to be on the same page. Oh, That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> I think Pam uh, described very well the discussion that we had in the GEO committee. So it's like a joint committee type thing. I was going to say, I think at that point, we've already had six zero on this one, but is this without, is this? Uh, I will, two? unless I count as two. Yeah, oh, that's right. It was only five. No, majority, right. Mr. You're right. Yeah, you, that's right. You keep eating dinner out. You know what I mean? Count as two. Um, so uh, <laughs> um, without objection, are we good? Very good. Without objection. Thanks. Okay. Okay. We are moving along. Um, the, the next recommendation, we're now section D, um, is annual school test evaluation levels. Um, and the current subdivision staging policy requires the planning board to assess school infrastructure adequacy. Um, through the annual school test at two tiers. So there's a cluster level test and then there is the individual school level test. Um, the individual school level test was the one that was added in 2016. Um, and it really was added to have a better idea and for council members and the public to have a better idea of what, what the conditions are in each individual school. At the cluster level only, um, there were times when a very, very overcrowded school uh, could be masked that condition by um, several undercrowded schools in the same cluster. Um, in this recommendation, the planning board's um, requesting to move to only the individual school level test. Um, and the reason for that is 
not only can the cluster test mask when one school is greatly overcrowded, um, when there are other undercrowded schools, underutilized schools, um, but in particular in the Blake cluster, there were a few overcrowded elementary schools that pushed the entire cluster into um, moratorium when in fact, some of the school service areas within that cluster were just fine. Uh, so it can have that perverse effect as well. And the committee um, concurred with the planning board on this 3-0 to support moving to just an individual school level test only. Okay, without objection, we're good. Thank you, Pam. Okay. The next is that the time horizon for the annual school test projections. Um, in recommendation 4.5, um, the planning board's recommended decreasing the time horizon used in evaluating projected school utilization from what is currently a five-year window into the future to a three-year uh, test window. Um, and the reason for this is they had a, a couple concerns um, related to the adequacy of, of looking five years versus three years. And the first one, um, so when you're looking into the future doing projections, you're looking at projected capacity and con projected enrollment. Um, for projected capacity, we are looking at what's been funded in the CIP. And their concern was um, that uh, occasionally funding in the out years of the CIP um, are, have a higher propensity to get delayed than, than funding that occurs earlier in the CIP. Um, however, really the CIP ones items are in the CIP. It is the council's um, commitment to those items to come through and to continue to be funded for school facilities. Um, the other is that enrollment forecasting um, can be more accurate in a three-year window versus a five-year window. And while that's true, um, MCPS does do an annual, um, it does a one-year forecast for every six years of the CIP. It does a 10-year forecast. It also does a 15-year forecast. Um, and in 2017 to 18, uh, MCPS had um, an educational consultant work with them for, I think, well over a year. They've now moved to like a four-model um, enrollment forecasting program. Uh, it, the results of that, have, um, there isn't enough data or, or uh, enrollment forecasting years under that to really be able to evaluate how well that is going to um, project what's going to happen or, or has happened. Um, but I think that that's coming. Um, regardless, if you move from five years to three, I, I think it, you could pretty easily say, well, yes, if, if you're looking only three years ahead, you have a little more certainty about what that means than five. That part of it's true. But the other piece of this that's equally important is um, we're looking into the future because this is really about when do we think development is going to affect our school facilities? When, on average, does an application, when it comes into the planning board and get approved, when does it actually follow through, through the site plan, through the building permit process, through construction, and then use an occupancy? If we really think that most or on average these applicants come forward and they get built and are affecting our neighborhood schools in three years, then moving to the three-year window um, can be even more accurate. But if on average we think that the five-year window is more accurate for how these projects move forward in time and affect the school facilities, then we would probably be more likely with the five-year window. Um, so I worked with um, the Department of Permitting Service staff and the planning staff, and we looked at all the residential development approvals for the last 10 years, since 2010. Uh, and we looked at all of the approval dates for all those projects, and we looked at the um, final building permit for each unit that was built. And when you look at that over them all, um, the average was four years and seven months. Uh, so in committee, Council Member Reamer moved to um, actually go in between, um, to pick a four-year window rather than stick with the five or move to a three-year window, and the committee um, agreed uh, three to zero. Does everybody agree with King Solomon Reamer on this one? Is that, uh, are we good? Without objection? So without objection, it's the four years. Okay, thank you. Um, I just will note for you when we get further into another day, probably Friday, talking about impact taxes, um, we'll still wanna show you maybe what other things might occur if the window were five or three, but that'll be up to the council if you decide to ask for different scenarios that that can still be brought forward we still have all that information but for right now we're going to be treating everything as four okay and these are all straw votes so yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. okay um 
We're moving on to item F in the uh, staff report, and it's the annual school test applicability. Um, the current school test uh, includes the number of additional students that a school can accommodate before reaching the moratorium threshold. Um, and this number is um, referred to usually as the staging ceiling capacity. Um, currently, an application for development cannot be approved if the number of students generated by that application exceed the staging ceiling capacity of any school served by the proposed development. Uh, recommendation 4.6 in the planning board draft proposes that the annual school test establish each school service area's adequacy status for the entirety of a fiscal year. Um, thus, the annual school test would basically be done and it would, or each school service area would have just an indicator saying it is open or if utilization premium payment is approved, uh, whether it's required or if there's a moratorium, whether that is in place. Um, and each application for development would, would be reviewed against this determination, um, but the number of students generated by the application would not be evaluated against a staging ceiling. Um, the staging ceilings are based on projected enrollment data that's gathered in the fall of each year. And the budget process that concludes in the spring usually gives us projected enrollment data, or sorry, gives us the projected capacity. Um, and those components make up the annual school test. Um, there are people that basically side on either side of this, this issue. It's very technical issue, very complicated to talk about. Um, there are those that feel that it should be stricter, that not only should the application be compared to the staging ceiling amount at the annual school test and that evaluation, but that um, any capacity that's approved for that development application should actually be removed from the staging ceiling limit. Um, that would that could literally on a weekly basis as the planning board meets to approve the application could change. Um, what is the status of um, any school service area for development and would make it very difficult for anybody doing a development application to ever know exactly what they're facing as they work through that long development process, whether or not the school um, will be under moratorium or would be required to make a school facility payment. Um, on the other side, even reviewing each application has its drawbacks and someone could think that even that is very specific and is not always accurate. So the planning board has said the, the most um, appropriate given the time frames for when enrollment forecasting is done and the budget is approved and the annual school test is approved is to basically have an annual school test that says for the next year, this is the condition. At the next school test, any um, new enrollment information that comes out in the fall, which will follow that annual school test will be reconsidered. Any new budgetary information will be reconsidered. And any applications approved over the year as MCPS does their form model enrollment forecasting will be incorporated in the way in which they're doing that with their form model system. And these things will then create the next annual school test so that the appropriate way is simply to have, yes, a test that says you're open or you require a payment or you're under moratorium. Um, and so, in committee, council members uh, Reamer and Friedson agreed with the planning board recommendation to go to the um, entirety of the fiscal year review. Um, and council member Juwanda dissented, supporting what the planning board is currently doing in it and evaluating each application against um, the stage and ceiling capacity. Thank you, council member Juwanda. Thank you, uh, Ms. Katz. Uh, I think Ms. Dunn, as always, does a great job explaining what has uh, what transpired of very technical things. I think I'm Solomon on this one. You know, the, there, there are some people who wanted to uh, have a much more strict test, uh, MCC, PTA, and others as noted. Uh, I think if you take on balance everything we're doing uh, in what we're going to discuss here in a few minutes, the, uh, the idea of the moratorium uh, being either eliminated completely and or my suggestion of raising the threshold significantly uh, as to minimize some of the challenges. Uh, either way, uh, you are um, moving in the direction of, you know, less potential uh, stop gaps when you have overcrowding. And I just think the current test is, while not perfect, uh, is, is preferable to uh, swinging either in either direction too much. So that was, uh, that was why I uh, suggested sticking with the current test, which again is admittedly not perfect, but either neither is the the other uh, the other two in my in my view. So I just wanted to explain that for for my colleagues' benefit. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Reamer. Thank you. Um, 
Well, I didn't hear a motion there, um, so I don't know uh, if we need to, you know, have too much explanation. I think Councilmember Jawando did observe that without a moratorium uh, applying, uh, this, the, you know, the, the the stakes here are considerably different. But uh, I'm going to try to explain this just because this is a technical issue, and we have to decide these in the in the case that anybody is a little unclear on it. I mean, if you are coming through with a project and there are a hundred students, you know, like a hundred students of capacity remaining, and I, is Gwen right on the call? Because I may ask her to clean up this mess I'm about to make. Um, and there's a hundred students remaining, uh, you know, and your project takes 30 and another project takes, you know, 50, uh, then the next project th that comes along you know, doesn't know if there is enough capacity to proceed. But meanwhile, there's two more projects that are going to come on later. And then at the end of the day, two or three of them are actually not going to go forward that year or the next year. They're going to get delayed. And in the end, it's not, it's a false precision that, you know, we are creating. We're, we're, we're assuming the stricter we are, the more we are assuming that every project coming through is going to happen on a certain timeline. And that's why the amount of capacity must be very, very tightly managed. Um, but I think what we see is that it's actually not so uh, clear. Like a project is coming through, but it may actually not move forward in a reasonably near, in the reasonable near term. And so you have to have a little bit of give in the system or else you're gonna be holding projects back that want to come forward in the name of capacity that isn't going to actually, you know, that you don't have to withhold. It's not a fun issue. Nobody particularly likes this, I think, uh, one way or the other. But I, I, I think you've got to have a system that recognizes that some projects in the end will not move forward on the timeline that they think that they will move on. And that's why you have to be very careful about over prescribing how you allocate the capacity. So, Gwen, if, you know. No, I, I was just going to say, I think you described it well. This, again, does, says that once a year, we do a check-in, and we will have a sense of which projects are real and which we think are really going to move forward and which, you know, maybe got an approval, but we realize are, for whatever reason, stalled. And, um, you know, it's something that, again, we, I think we do it in coordination with MCPS. It's something that we work together on. But we think that it's better to pick a one-year point in time and do this evaluation than trying to keep a running list of projects that may or may not actually in reality move forward. It's another part of the goal of this particular update to try to tie the growth and infrastructure policy more tightly in with reality rather than simply with formulas. Right. So do we need, Dr. Orland, the reason that you cut on your... Oh, I, I think it's useful just to actually put an example out there and show how these three different ways of doing it works. Um, and this will just take a minute. Uh, if you have a high school a service area and the at the school test application time, July 1st, uh, the planning board identifies there is a uh, spare capacity, uh, staging capacity of 100 students in that high school starting at the beginning of the year. Um, the planning board's proposal is that because it's a positive number, then any development that comes in during the course of that year in that cluster would be approved. Um, the other the other extreme, I guess, was uh, actually what the council approved in 2007 but was never really implemented, which was that uh, as individual developments came in, you determined how many students were actually going to be generated by that development. And as they were approved, it drew down from that 100 to the point where if it hit zero, then no more developments within that high school area could be approved during that fiscal year. Um, the, the middle course, what the planning board has been doing for the last few years, has been to say, 
that, uh, again, starting with 100, if a development comes in and a development is going to generate 101 students, the answer is no. Um, that's too many students that's going to exceed the 100. However, if three or four or five uh, 50 unit, uh, 50 unit, 50 student developments come through, they will all be approved. So it's not the cumulative, but if it's lower than that 100 that's set. So, um, the, so the first example is what the planning board's recommending and the, and the committee majority committee's recommending. And the third of those options, the one that's the planning board's doing now is what Mr. Jawando is proposing. I just wanted to put it in this case. Thank you, you, Council Member Rice. Well, thank you very much. And so, um, look, in, in, in hearing this and not being a member of either of the joint committees, but sharing our education and culture committee, this is an important one. Um, but it's one in which I think that, again, what we've gotten to in terms of practice uh, when it comes to our schools is really trying to use the uh, most up-to-date data that we have to be able to help to guide our decisions. And so I am un understanding where the Joint Committee landed uh, in terms of trying to utilize that most recent information to help guide in terms of what happens, because it's not just about that, but it's also about capacity projects that happen at the schools. Uh, and those may change, right? And things may happen as a result because of uh, capacity that's needed because a school has reached a certain. And so between that year, there could be other things that are projected. And so having that one year look, that annual uh, test actually gives us the best ability to utilize uh, the most up-to-date data that we have. It still doesn't address uh, the issue that Councilmember Member Juwanda was talking about, which is uh, at some point, if we allow all of this to move forward, then what happens when it comes to capacity? And we'll address that later. But I think for this one that I certainly understand and agree um, that utilizing the most up-to-date uh, information at this point makes sense. Thank you. And that's where I am. As, as I've mentioned time and time again, I get very concerned about arbitrary numbers. And that's 135. I mean, as, as much as that's a safety valve, it's an arbitrary number. And I don't know that 135 would be really the number that we would want. So I'm I'm with what the majority of the committee suggested. And with that, do we need a motion? How are we going to do that? We're we're still on the timeline for the test, right? Okay. Yes. So we have a committee recommendation, which I defer to staff, but I think it is a motion. So uh, that's a committee recommendation, is what you're yeah. saying. We had a okay. two-one recommendation. Okay. So it is going to be with objection, though. I have a feeling. So uh, all those in favor of the committee recommendation, please raise your hand. That is Councilmember Glass, Councilmember Katz, Councilmember Friedson, Councilmember Reamer, Councilmember Armanaz, that's five. Councilmember Rice is six. Council Vice President Hucker is seven. Councilmember Navarro is eight. All those opposed, please raise your hand. Councilmember Juwanda, very good. So it, the straw vote is eight to one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, we're moving along. And in the staff report, we're on item G. Um, and these were um, subdivision staging policy recommendations that were in the draft, um, but not in the uh, proposed draft resolution. And the first one has to do with, uh, I guess it's uh, Bill 3720. Um, it, was, it has to do with retesting for school adequacy when an applicant seeks um, an extension of their adequate public facility uh, validity period. So when an application comes to the planning board and is getting approved, it is given um, an adequate public facility or APFO validity period, anywhere from five to 10 years. Um, and you will occasionally, uh, there will be applicants that start to come to the end of that validity period. And for whatever reasons, they've had major delays. It can be environmental, it can be financing, it can be you know a, a variety of things that we probably couldn't guess. Um, so they're coming toward the end of their APFO validity period and they're not prepared yet to go and get their building permit, um, which would uh, is kind of the marker for them reaching um, and doing what they need to do within that validity period. Um, so they seek an extension. They come to the planning board and they ask for an extension of their validity period. Currently, uh, if they come for that extension, they can't ask for additional density, and the, which is one of the requirements of um, asking for it. You cannot also request more density, but the board can also um, doesn't provide any additional um, unknown conditions on their project. It's really just about the APFO validity 
And with respect to transportation, um, the board can ask the applicant to show that in the ensuing time, since they had their first approval till they've asked for their extension, that, that nothing significant has changed with respect to their transportation and ask them to do um, a transportation study to prove that. There has never been a mention of school adequacy um, at the point of asking for an APFO extension. And so the planning board's uh, proposal here, recommendation 4.14, is um, to um, ask the applicant at the time of asking for the APFO extension to provide um, an updated school test. Um, if they've come near the end of their APF approval period, they've also probably reached the end of the window at which the school test had been approved and had looked into the future. If you think about that, if they're coming in five years and the school test was five years in the future, whatever had happened and whatever that proposed um, status would be for that approval um, is now no longer relevant because they're not building at that five-year window they're asking um, to build in the future. Um, so the committee discussed this um, and the planning board spoke about it. Um, and the uh, committee agreed to this three to zero to ask the applicant to um, provide an update to the annual school test results, to, to retest, to look at what their conditions would be at the time of their APF extension. Um, but the committee also asked that there be some bounds put on it, um, possibly something about the extent to which they might um, impact their school community, what size project it might be. So uh, planning department provided a limit um, suggesting that um, this would really only apply to projects where the remaining unbuilt units would generate more than 10 students at any school serving that development. So um, it really then allows maybe very small projects that are having trouble meeting their APFO deadline to still move forward without the retest, but would have captured larger projects that may then have an impact on schools. Okay. Is there an objection on that? Or questions yes. anyway? We're good without objection. Okay. Oh, there. Okay. All right. I'll keep moving forward. Um, other uh, element here, which was um, a recommendation to expand the role of the Montgomery County Public School representative on the Development Review Committee. Um, the Development Review Committee is currently an interagency task force comprised of representatives from public agencies and utilities. Um, the members discuss um, with planning staff the applications for development, and they provide written comments that the planning staff then use in their staff reports that go before the planning board for approval. And currently, um, MCPS is a representative on the DRC, but really only for projects that involve school site planning, not for any residential project that comes through. So this recommendation by the planning board is really to expand that role of the MCPS representative on the DRC, the Development Review Committee, and request that if uh, the Development Review Committee is undertaking the review of a project involving residential development. Continuum is done without objection. Great. Um, okay, so we have now gotten to H, which is uh, School Adequacy Standards and the Residential Development Moratorium. Dun, dun, dun. Is appropriate music for the moment. It's right. very appropriate. Okay. Okay. And it's her last name. So I mean, yeah. <laughs> and, and I think that was a 6-3 that they thought it was appropriate. But anyhow, <laughs> go ahead. Um, so recommendation 4.5 in the draft and recommendation 4.16 relate to utilization adequacy standards and rules that apply when a school service area is deemed overutilized. Um, so in the planning board draft, they provide um, recommendation 4.5, and it has a table showing you that 120% um, in the Greenfield area and um, the turnover and infill areas, at 120% of school utilization, premium payment would be required, um, and at 125% in the Greenfield area, only a moratorium would be put in place. Um, and so the committee spent a lot of time talking about uh, the different things that are involved in school utilization thresholds. Um, uh, in the SSP at 120%, we have, first of all, we have a countywide school utilization, um, a school adequacy standard. So um, adequacy is deemed um, appropriate up to 120% of utilization, and that's countywide. Any school in the, in the county, whether it be elementary, middle, or high school, once you read 120%, um, if you're over that, then your school service area is placed in moratorium for residential approvals. Um, so this is a, a deviation from that, from, from the planning board, that they would actually 
look at the utilization threshold um, standard for one part of the county different from the rest of the county. The planning board spends a good portion of the section of their draft on this, um, and it's, it's important to note, um, what are the issues revolving moratorium? Because this is a move away from what we've typically done. They, they keep the moratorium in the Greenfield area. They're getting rid of moratorium and turnover and infill. Um, and, and the reason is multiple fold that um, moratorium on development, when they have shown throughout the draft that um, new development only contributes about 25 to 30% to enrollment growth. And when you put the moratorium in place, it doesn't necessarily stop construction because we know that any project that's already been approved and in the pipeline of development is still allowed to move forward. So I think it also provides that false sense that, that nothing else will happen in a neighborhood if there's a moratorium. Um, and in addition to that, we know that about 75% of enrollment growth um, in, the, in the county is really related to the turnover in the single family housing stock. So these are reasons why that um, moratorium is no longer just simply um, they're going to build in an area or not build in an area. And if we stop it, then nothing will happen, that the growth will stop. Um, that's not necessarily the case. And in addition to that, um, the board spends a lot of time talking about the negative externalities of a development moratorium um, and its impact on housing development, affordable housing, and economic growth. Um, so the fundamental question that was posed to the committee was whether it was in the best interest of the county to retain moratorium on residential development when school utilization reaches a certain threshold. Um, and where the committee ended up, um, two to one, council members Friedson and Reamer opposed the school moratorium idea, uh, given the negative externalities that it provides to the county. And council member Jawanda expressing concern over those externalities, but still feeling that at some level there should be um, a threshold that is, if we really reach this, it is too high and too great of an enrollment um, problem in the school service area, and we should have a moratorium, um, and that's where they landed. The general okay. framework. Thank you, Councilmember Reamer. Great, thank you so much, uh, Pam. Appreciate your, your your work on this, and uh, I'm, I, um, I know we'll hear from planning as well. Uh, I just wanted to kick off the conversation here on behalf of the committee recommendation. Uh, I think this is one of the most consequential parts of this policy that we're taking up, which is one of the most consequential policies that we will take up uh, with these four years. Um, I think to have a policy that uh, puts a hard stop on housing when you have a housing shortage is profoundly problematic. And as council member Navarro uh, will recall it, when when the county went through the process of embracing the regional housing goals, two issues were held up uh, regionally as examples of what local governments are doing wrong when it comes to housing. Uh, and one of them was having a housing moratorium in place. Uh, on, the, on the positive side, a, a good example was also provided, which was accessory dwelling units, which we have acted upon. But, uh, you know, just as a starting point, we have a regional housing shortage, we have a county housing shortage, and yet we have a hard stop on new housing where the private sector would like to build new housing. Um, but more, more broadly, you know, I really use my own uh, uh, school cluster as, as a vivid example, downtown Silver Spring, Blair High School cluster, uh, Northwood, you know, Einstein. Those are crowded schools, you know. We, I think we all acknowledge that. The revitalization of downtown Silver Spring is one of the biggest success stories that this county has to celebrate and, and has had for decades. Um, it, is a, it is a community that is so emblematic of Montgomery County. It's such a, a success of who we are as a community, what we, what we aspire to. Um, it is also an economic development engine for the county, and it is a it's an engine of new housing opportunities. It is just uh, it's a spectacular success story. That has, fortunately, which was the goal all along, brought people to want to live near downtown Silver Spring, and as a result, they moved there with children to enroll in the schools. Um, you know. Uh, on my own block, we have six, six or seven more kids this year than we did last year. And I know it has a lot to do with the appeal of Silver Spring. Why we would say we're going to put a halt 
to the continuing progress of Silver Spring because people are moving here to enjoy it. Uh, to me, it just makes no sense. Uh, we've got to meet our challenge by constructing new capacity, shifting boundaries around, doing other things that don't cause us to lose the benefits that we get from revitalization. Now, I don't want to be too Silver Spring centric because this is a major issue countywide. But wherever it is that you want to see change and positive progress, you know, Germantown, Rockville, Bethesda, um, you know, East County, uh, White Oak, wh wherever it is, you want the private sector to come in and change what you see around you and, and put up new and better. And having that happening constantly in this county is what we want. It's what we need. And it's what other communities in the region are getting. But we have a wall in front of that in much of the county. When you look at the chart showing where the moratoriums are applied, they are all over the county. And we are constantly doing contortions to try to figure out how to solve for them um, that I think create more problems than they solve. Uh, and I think that's fundamentally the problem with the moratorium. I think it does more harm than good. I understand the logic of it. There's times when I've said to myself, well, why should we add two or three more kids to a, to a crowded school? But guess what? Those two or three more kids just got added because another family just arrived. Why would we hold up the progress and change that we need in our built environment, in our economic development, in our housing, in our transportation infrastructure, in our stormwater infrastructure, in our green building infrastructure, all these other things that we need, why would we hold those up just because of a problem that we have better solutions to? So I, I, uh, I am pleased by the committee's recommendation um, and I'm really grateful to the planning board for taking on you know, very directly uh, such a difficult challenge and giving us uh, such a thoughtful way to, to grapple with it. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Juwando. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, couple items here. I think there's something important to remember that, you know, the, as I, as Ms. Dunn pointed out, I, I, the moratorium as it's currently functioning is, is not, uh, has a lot of negative and downsides to it. Um, but you do get to a point, if you think about what this is about, what the growth policy and adequate uh, infrastructure, I got it, I think, what we named it. Uh, policy is about, it's about just that, how we grow and, and, and having adequate infrastructure for when we grow. And so in my mind, there, there has to be a tipping point and it's not an exact science. And I, and, and I'm sensitive to your point, Mr. President, but you know, we should probably all resign if we're looking for exact sciences on the county council. But the, uh, at some point you get to a point where you know, even if it's only 25 to 30 percent of new development causing additional, you know, being responsible for 25 to 30 percent of more kids, new development, that is, where too much is too much. And there are other things we need to do. And, and, and I think you also have to take this into the context of the entire policy. We can't say that we don't there, if there's no stopgap measure and then we're not funding the adequate infrastructure, uh, either through increased revenue or these, you know, some form of these UPP payments. We're going to talk about in a minute, the UPP payments. And I also have a proposal there. I find it very hard to accept that you're going to say no moratorium. So no emergency stopgap, whether it's 135, which I initially proposed or 140, 150, you know, school one and a half times its capacity. There's nothing to stop it. And then we're going to have these minuscule which the committee also recommended against my proposal, utilize, utilization premium payments that are going to cover a fraction of the of the impact. And then the overall, and I know we're not going into the taxes overall today that much, the overall effect of this is to lower the revenue of all the impact taxes. And so it's hard for me to say like we're, we're, all that's going to happen and then we're still not going to have a stopgap and we're going to, we'll figure it out when they get overcrowded. I just I just don't think that's a responsible approach. And I want to minimize the downsides of the imperfect tool of the moratorium. That's why I propose 135. Uh, and I'm going to make that as a, as a motion here. But I think we have to have something 
that kicks in. And I think it's a combination of a higher moratorium and or much higher utilization premium payments, which we'll talk about in a second. But we have to have something because it's not it's not saying we don't want the development. And I watched downtown Silver Spring develop. My mom worked down there. I grew up there. I, I you know, I, I want it to happen in other places like, you know, Long Branch and East County where I live now. It's not about that. And I reject the false premise that if you are worried about school capacity, that you're against progress. This is about we have to have a stopgap measure. And these are and, and, and I think this is a reasonable, reasonable approach to doing that. So um, you can't have it both ways. We have to do something. We have to you have to raise revenue in another way or you have to have a stopgap or some combination. So uh, I would like to move that we would uh, move the moratorium countywide consistent with our previous you know, discussions to 135%. Move by Council Member Jawando. Uh, is there a second? I'm gonna second for the sake of conversation, Mr. President, at this point. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Council Member Rice. Thank you, Mr. President. So we find ourselves in an interesting conundrum here, and I'm not a big fan of moratoriums. Everyone knows that. Um, you saw what I did in downtown Silver Spring. Uh, as you heard from Councilmember Jawando and Councilmember Reamer, that was home for me. Uh, went to Montgomery Blair High School, and so I saw. I used to go to City Place before City Place is what it is now, even though it's still not the best, uh, and there's still more room that needs to be done there to bring it to the full uh, dream of what I think uh, downtown Silver Spring can be. Well, let me say this. Um, it's tough uh, because I've been in schools and seen the challenges that they face. All of us I know have and heard from parents and teachers and students uh, who are in these schools that are overcrowded as well, right? And so the question is, how best do we try and get a handle on this? And there's so many things that are at fault for it. Right. So let me start with the first one. And, and I apologize, Mr. President, but this is this is something that's really important. So I'm going to take a little bit of a trip down memory lane for us here. Part of it is, is that what happens at the state level? Um, we never got adequate funding from the state when it came to school construction. And that's one of the things that primarily put us square in the crosshairs of having overcrowded schools. And that's a statewide problem, not just a Montgomery County problem. Um, now, that is pitched to be fixed somewhat um, by the Build to Learn Act, and we hope that the General Assembly, uh, I assume, uh, the General Assembly will override the governor's veto this coming January, and we'll start to see more state dollars flow, which will help with that overcrowding. Uh, and so that will certainly, because there, there is nobody in MCPS uh, leadership who wants to have crowded schools. So let's just be clear about that as well. Um, they propose every single year to have way more projects than we as a county can afford to fund. Uh, and so from that perspective, let's put the blame squ squarely where the blame is, right? Um, now, there is an argument uh, about the other part of the blame, which is development and saying, well, if you develop then, you know, and you're creating more housing, then we have more people and theoretically, then you have more students. Well. Now we're learning, that's what we used to think. Now we're learning that, well, a lot more comes from turnover, like what happened in the house that my wife and my two children just moved into that was a retired family who moved off to Florida. So we increased uh, when we first moved here in November of last year, two students into the high school cluster for Northwest. Now they were already in the high school cluster for Northwest. So we're kind of, you know, and that's one of the things to gauge as well, but at the same time, in this neighborhood for feeding into Northwest, we added two additional students. And we see that anecdotally through a lot of us in our own, own personal stories. I mean, when we think about the people who we bought our houses from, right? For all of us who have children, right? We think about who moved out and we moved in with our kids. We probably had more kids than they did, right? And so it goes right in line with what we're finding in terms of tone turnover being the real driver so not necessarily development's fault. Sure, they play a part, um, but not their fault in terms of that they're the driving factor. So right now we've got turnover, something that we can't control, right? Because people are going to continue to age out. And I was talking to a good friend of mine who's actually in real estate law, who's telling me that he and his family are about to 
uh, move and go down to Florida. Uh, and so their house will be taken over by a person with children. And so that's, we won't, that we will never be able to control that. That will continue to happen. And so that's a major driving factor. So the question is, do we address it from that standpoint and address that as the driving factor? Do we address it from the driving factor of, well, our schools are forced uh, to be able to not have the amount of money uh, that they need to because of the state not giving uh, enough money to fund school construction. And so from that standpoint, do we say, well, we're gonna stop development? That's a hard question, right? Because yeah, the council member Reamer, you're right. Um, you know, the same amount of turnover that comes into a neighborhood that comes from turnover, that comes from, you know, uh, an additional development. And so it's, let's say 10 and 10, right? Which one is the worst 10 or which one is the 10 that you shouldn't allow to move forward? That's a good question. That's what we have to decide. That's what's before us. And so that's what makes this really hard. That's why I wanna um, hear from my colleagues and hear from the planning board. Now that I've, I, because for me, it's, it's one in which I'm sympathetic with where Council Member Juwanda is coming from and where NCCPTA and others and parents and you know, uh, education advocates have expressed concern. Well, if you don't have a, a tipping point, if you don't have that stopgap that's there, then things can just run off the rails. Well, I don't know if that's necessarily true because if I do trust our school system in terms of leadership, they should be advocating to have these projects move forward with additional funding, assuming that we have additional funding. Now, will it always be enough? Absolutely not. But we think it'll be better than where we are right now. So we're kind of playing this crystal ball game too that's kind of out there also. And so I, I find myself caught in the middle. Um, I, I certainly understand and again, uh, wanna make sure that we're not you know, painting ourselves into a corner here um, where we don't have any protections for something that is incredibly important. We know that when it comes to uh, overcrowded classrooms, they oftentimes happen in our communities of color, children with lower socioeconomic status, children who have English as a second language. We know that that's the preponderance of those schools. Uh, and so from that perspective, that's something to think about. And so I have to, as Council Member Navarro has uh, made sure that she's beaten into my head, look at this with an equity uh, and social justice lens. So thank you, Madam Navarro for that. Um, so. Again, that, that, that is part of this thinking, but at the same time, um, I also think about the affordable housing that's there for those uh, communities as well. And what that new development represents, something I've been fiercely fighting for that we'll have a conversation about later uh, when we talk about what it means to continue to grow opportunities for affordable housing, especially in places where we typically don't have it now. So there are a multitude of competing interests that are here in this topic. Um, so again, Mr. President, I wanted to second this motion uh, to give us the ability to have the conversation. I really wanna hear, um, and so I'm not sure if Mr. Uh, Sartori or uh, Ms. Wright wanna re respond to what I've said, even Ms. Dunn, I certainly welcome that because I'm open to hearing your thoughts, uh, but then certainly wanna hear what my colleagues' thoughts are as well as we debate this very important topic. Okay, Council Member Freitson. No, 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 Mr. President, uh, Mr. Sartori was about to respond. I'm sorry. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't see him. Sure. Uh, that, Go ahead. Sure, thank you. Uh, for the record, Jason Sartori with the planning department. Um, yeah, so I, I think everything we've heard has been kind of hit the nail on the head with a lot of the issues that are, are part of this, right? It's not an easy decision. Um, but I think that the approach that the planning board took um, and uh, yeah, uh, the chairman can can correct me if I'm wrong here, but was was kind of something that kind of hit that middle uh, sweet spot to a certain extent, right? The the idea that you know 73% of the enrollment growth that we're seeing is coming from turnover. That's countywide, but that's not consistent everywhere in the county. We have parts of the county where. It, it really, it, uh, it's almost entirely coming from turnover. And in those parts of the county was where, that's where you know, the planning board had recommended completely eliminating the moratorium. There's no need to keep it in an area because a moratorium at 135% is not gonna prevent the student that's coming from the house that just sold. <clears throat> um, and it's not gonna prevent it at 120% either. So it doesn't, you know, but there are parts of the county where it is much higher than 27%. It's, you know, it's almost a flip in, in that with the area that had been identified as Greenfield, 
that is basically the opposite of what we're seeing elsewhere, where the majority of the enrollment growth, if not three quarters of it, is coming from that new development. And so that was an area where a moratorium could still be effective at saying, we need to kind of slow things down here so that the schools can catch up. Uh, so that is, you know, the one point that I would take from this was that, you know, the, the planning board tried to take a look at the different contexts that we have in different parts of the county and what type, what is actually driving the enrollment growth in those different areas. Thank you. Ms. Wright, did you have anything uh, to add? Well, and, and I'd like uh, for Chair Anderson to weigh in as well. I, I think that um, I, I would just hearken back to the fact that um, we're the only jurisdiction in the entire region that has moratoriums. And even with moratoriums, we have had to deal with overcrowding and honestly, very similar issues to our neighboring jurisdictions who don't have moratoriums. And, um, you know, I, I know we all think Northern Virginia is going so great, but I still have a lot of friends in Alexandria and they're, they're struggling with school capacity. They don't have moratoriums. They're struggling with school capacity, but they're finding ways to respond to that with creative ways to retrofit their existing schools, finding spaces to build new schools, all the things that I know we've been discussing with MCPS. But what the moratorium does do, um, yeah, I, I think that, that that's really the point. It, it, I don't know that we're better or worse off in terms of actually solving our school capacity issues because of a moratorium. But what the moratorium does do is creates the impression that we as a county are ready to stop development in its tracks, that we are ready to stop housing in its tracks, and that we are, um, you know, we're ready to have these very, very restrictive uh, rules that, um, you know, do certainly, I think, affect how we're viewed as a, a county uh, that, that, you know, wants housing and wants other kinds of development. So, you know, I think that, um, you know, the, 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 when we had an interesting discussion about, you know, was the moratorium a really good tool back in the old days when we were doing all greenfield development or wasn't it a good tool? Well, that perhaps is neither here nor there at this point. I think that the thing that really is significant is it's not solving our problem. You know, I even think about the idea that if we had 135% cap, what happens if you have a community that achieves that 135% capacity, but they have no development cases coming up? because it may be an area where they're experiencing extreme turnover. And we've sort of seen that honestly in certain parts of the county where folks have come in and really been very upset about the, um, the, number, the, the school capacity in their schools. And I go back and I look at our pipeline and our list and there's like no development going on whatsoever. There's nothing happening. Um, and so, you know, I, I guess, it's sort of, uh, um, it's really a question in some ways of, uh, you know, what's the message we send and how do we, uh, how do we really get to the heart of the capacity issue and focus on solving that? Because I don't think that moratoriums are doing that for us. Okay, thank you. Uh, Casey Anderson, I understand he is on mute. So if someone from staff can, well, yeah, I'm off I, of you. okay. I think I'm off. Yeah. Um, I want to. I want to. I, I, um, I know you want to move on, but I just wanted to make a couple uh, points about the discussion that's been had so far. First, remember that the school impact taxes are calculated at 100 percent of the cost of each seat that's generated. So the base rate completely covers 
the cost of the school impact that's generated by each new project. So any, you know, this characterization of the UPP as being minuscule, if it's anything over the base rate, it's more than paying its share, which is not a big deal. I mean, that's not an unreasonable thing to ask for a little more, but the idea that new development should make up the shortfall in every other category of revenue, as Councilman Rice had pointed out, the state's coming up short. You know, there's a lot of contributors to this, and yet for some reason, we're asking new development to to make up the pick up the slack for every other problem we have in getting schools funded, and that comes at great cost to the public's interest in generating housing. Which brings me to the second point, which is that at the Fed work sessions. I think Mr. Sartori made a really great point that I think bears repeating. The fact that new development is not generating most of the problem is not important just because it suggests there's other contributors and therefore new development shouldn't get all the blame. But the answer to the question, well, why would you allow any more development even if it's only a few additional students? I think the answer is stopping development with a moratorium stops a lot of housing but it doesn't stop very many students. So the relative costs and benefits of a moratorium when new development is not generating very much of the problem are completely out of whack. And the last thing I'll say is last year when we allowed the moratorium to go in effect, it's not just that others in the region didn't follow suit. They didn't say, wow, what a brilliant idea. The various publications around the country, I think there was one article in Slate, if I'm not mistaken, and there were some other articles in the trade press nationally saying, can you believe this? This jurisdiction actually stopped development because the schools are crowded? That's crazy. This is not a policy that's, uh, we've got a lot of really forward-thinking policies in this county that have attracted attention from across the country and been copied and modeled based on the idea that we were really forward thinking and really had some good ideas. This is not one of them. This is an idea which has been viewed outside this jurisdiction as perverse. I think that's not too strong a statement. And so I think that we really are overdue for, for putting this to bed because by definition, if you are allowing a UPP, a premium payment in crowded areas, New development is paying more than its share and it's contributing to the solution. If you cut it off, you're really cutting off your nose to spite your face because you're losing out on additional revenue to help solve the problem which is created by other causes. Thank you. Mr. Mr. President, can I just go ahead? Can go I ahead. say before no no because because I just wanted to respond to that and just say thank you. That has been tremendous and that was one of the things I was struggling with. So you've helped me tremendously. I just wanted to say thank you for that. Sorry, Councilmember Friedson. Councilmember Friedson, he's very patient. You know, I'm very patient, and I would never want to stop you from arriving at the place I was hoping you'd arrive at. I'm going to say, especially when you're agreeing uh, yeah, with him. Yeah. yeah. Uh, snatch conflict from consensus uh, among uh, amongst colleagues is never something that I would intend to do. But uh, appreciate all the comments here. I mean, this is a big issue, uh, but to me, it shouldn't be that hard of an issue given all of our other policy priorities that we have. To be clear. You know, moratorium to me isn't just a policy from a bygone era, uh, as has been suggested. It's a draconian policy that does not in any way address the problem it's intending to solve. It does not generate revenue or resources for school capacity, which is the problem it's intending to solve. In fact, it does the direct opposite. It cuts off revenue and resources that would otherwise address school capacity. So uh, th for that reason, I don't believe that uh, keeping it in uh, any part of the county, including Clarks Clarksburg is appropriate. Not only do I think we should have a uniform policy on something as important as moratorium countywide, uh, but I also think that it's not a policy that actually solves the problem it intends to. And so why would we keep it uh, anywhere uh, in the county? Certainly there is data to suggest that there are differences with different types of school capacity and we have levers to address that. We had a very colorful conversation the other day uh, that addressed uh, some of that and there's room for discussion of uh, where to land there, but you know that's the way that we address it. The, the, the purpose of this is to charge the cost of a student. That, that is the purpose of this plan. It is not to shut off new residents. And to be clear, 
this is a tax on new residents. That's what this is. And the data is clear on where the student generation is coming from. And so we are charging uh, for, for, for the new uh, students. The other aspect of this is it is a wall. The, you know, housing policy and local government is our version of immigration policy. It's who we decide who can access our community, where they can access our community, what uh, uh, part of our community they can access. And moratorium puts up a wall and says that they can't be in certain places at certain times. That is not who we are in Montgomery County. That is not a value uh, that we have in Montgomery County. Rather than a wall, we should have a welcome sign. And we should be inviting and, and encouraging new residents and new investment and new families. And instead, we're saying where you should and shouldn't go, when you should and shouldn't go there based on uh, what the existing residents have done. We are blaming new residents for the circumstances caused by existing residents. There is no new resident that caused the existing school overcrowding issue. And if that doesn't sound familiar, of blaming new residents for the existing circumstances that have nothing to do with them, based on other ways that we address uh, these issues nationally and, and elsewhere, I don't know uh, what else is. Uh, the other piece of this is there are major equity issues here. You know, we talk about equity a lot, and, and Councilmember Navarro has you know, really been pushing this issue and is absolutely right. But the idea that we would be directing resources exclusively to the places where there is existing development and driving new residents to, 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 to those places and new investment to those places at the expense of the other places, that means that the places that there is already new development gets funding for new school capacity, which means they probably get more investment, which means that, they, that it leaves behind other places, not just the school facilities, but the investment in those facilities, because we know that what is one of the best ways to drive new investment, new families, new businesses, it's to have great schools. And so the idea that we would misalign those priorities in the way that we have through this policy is just completely out of step with everything else we try to do in Montgomery County. And so I understand why people are frustrated with school overcrowding and why this feels like it solves the problem. I get it. Enough is enough. I understand that. And that's how it feels to most residents. But this is a scapegoating. And it's a policy that doesn't address the problem. What we need to do, and I appreciate Councilmember Rice mentioning the state support. You know, we have you know, historically about 19% of the school capacity, we get about 13% of the school resource uh, funding. We have, uh, the state has c continuously added burdens to the county, including the pension shift and other things uh, that have happened over the last, you know, 10 to 15 years that have made it harder for us to meet our obligations. Uh, we need to figure out ways to create more school capacity by generating more resources. And the last way to do that is to cut off development, to cut off new investment, to cut off uh, new residents. That's what moratorium does. I absolutely hope uh, we do the forward thinking thing. We do the, the right thing here and we eliminate this policy. And the last piece that I'll say, and I think Chairman Anderson uh, raised these points extremely well, the idea that by paying more than the cost of the students that you're generating is somehow not paying for the burden that you're creating is defies math. If you're paying 120, 140, or 160% of the students that you're generating, by definition, you are being charged for conditions that you did not create. You're being charged for conditions you're adding to, but not conditions uh, that, that you created. Again, these are taxes on new residents and things that I think we should be really careful uh, 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 towards in that sense. And I just think we have to be careful as well on the flip side of this. We want to generate new resources. Moratorium generates zero dollars. All it does is stop new residents from being able to live here. Generates zero dollars. In fact, it costs us money because it uh, stops folks from investing. And the UPPs, the utilization premium payments, will generate additional resources. So not only will it, uh, you know, will it 
uh, add to uh, funding, but it adds above and beyond the cost of the students that are being created, being generated uh, by the, 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 the new development. And it is more than paying for uh, the added student, it is adding to, 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 to the added students. And we have to be very careful as we do that to balance the moratorium by another name. We, we make the we make the utilization premium payments too high. And while it sounds good because it sounds like we'll generate more revenue, if it stops the investment and it stops the development, we end up creating moratorium by another name and we end up in the same place we are now. We've just called it something different. And so I think we have to strike that right balance. I believe that the Fed committee did a good job of striking that appropriate balance, figuring out how do we generate additional resources for our schools while not placing a wall, but creating a welcome sign for new residents, new investment, and the new vibrancy that we want and that we need. We have to get out of this toxic commentary in Montgomery County that has plagued us since I grew up here, which is that new residents are a burden and that we have to charge them for the burden that they're creating in our community. That is not the reality. New residents are a huge asset and communities that fail to attract new residents die. Countries that don't allow for immigration die, particularly advanced countries because their birth rates are too low uh, because of education levels and communities like ours, high educated, uh, lively communities. If we stop attracting new young families, new residents with school age children, then our community will go backwards uh, not go forward. It's not who we are. It's not what we should do. This is absolutely at the core and at the heart of the top and most important issues that this council has been a leader on. And I hope we will uh, demonstrate our leadership once again on this issue. So thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Did you have an opinion on that, Mr. Friedson? <laughs> um, council Member Auburn uh, Thank you, Mr. President. I think I'm going to have to pour myself another cup of coffee pretty soon <laughs> here. Um, it's a lot of information to process, and I have grown to really appreciate and respect the complexity of all of this. I had a flashback to 1992 when I was a student at Walt Whitman High School, and that was when the then Council and Planning Board would have been having this exact same discussion then, and I was completely oblivious, and right around then, 28 years ago, I would have been at soccer practice, um, but it strikes me that that year I was at Whitman, uh, our graduation class was around 367 seven students. Um, I spoke at Whitman's graduation last year, and it was almost twice as many. And so as I've come to appreciate and learn this naturally occurring process that occurs from generation to generation, I think it strikes me that the good news is people continue to want to come to Montgomery County. And it's because of our incredible public school system. It's because of our high quality of life. And so the good news is, is that Families come in as other families move out and as other families age out. And let's hope that that continues for generations to come. But it also strikes me that there is an indisputable fact that we have acknowledged many times over that we don't have a sufficient housing stock at numerous different levels here in the county. And I think the moratorium has played a role in preventing us from achieving the type of diversity and housing stock that we need to attract a wide variety of residents here in Montgomery County from different ages, from different cultures and communities, from different economic backgrounds, that vibrancy that you need to ensure a sustainable community moving forward. I've said this before from the dais, but our first condo when Catherine and I got married was 485 square feet. And we didn't have a car at the time. And so we moved as close as we could to a metro. Uh, and I was, Catherine was still in grad school and I was still working for a nonprofit organization that was within walking distance of where we lived. But there wasn't really very many options for us in Montgomery County that we could choose from in the price point that we were looking for with the types of amenities that we were looking for. And because we both grew up in Montgomery County and our families resided in Montgomery County, we naturally went to Montgomery County because that was where we would go next. 
But had we been from another part of the country, we may not have been as inclined to establish our families there. And so having housing levels at all levels so that as we move through life, as we cycle through life, we have options for our families. And to Councilmember Friedson's point, um, we have that ability to attract new residents, which will correspond to economic development, will correspond to some of these other challenges that we're trying to resolve. And so I think the moratorium sends a chilling message, has sent a chilling message uh, to com companies that have considered investing here. Uh, and I think as we have heard, it has not been effective in addressing the underlying issues that it was trying to address. And so while I greatly respect and agree that there has to be a check and balance, I don't think that the moratorium, moratorium is, is that check or balance that's appropriate. Um, and so I'm not gonna support this motion, but do look forward to the next round of conversations we have regarding UPP. And as the day is getting long, by the way, as I was reading the packet, I couldn't get Naughty by Nature song out of my head um, as I was reading it all the way through. But we'll get to that in a second. Um, but I, I really um, want to express my appreciation to all of my colleagues, both past and present, uh, that have been here before um, addressing these very complex issues. But I do think it's time to put to bed the moratorium and move forward with a different check and balance. And we'll have that discussion as we go through. Thank you, Council Member Navarro. Thank you, Mr. President. So, um, you know, I mean, this particular exercise of this particular SSB has been really interesting and complex, but also very exciting because it gives us an opportunity to literally change the paradigm. And I, you know, am, I am totally grateful to the decisions that were made in the past and the assessments that were made in the past because we're trying to address some of the challenges that we face. I think that we would not uh, be true to our duty as uh, elected officials and as public servants here if we didn't recognize that we have some challenges in this county right now. And that this issue of housing is huge. It is at the core of so many different goals that we say every day we're trying to attain. It is all about equity. It is about creating and stimulating economic activity so that we can also realize that kind of revenue. And as some, somebody said earlier, I think it was Council Member Friedson, this notion and this message that I think is so hideous, you know, that we want to make it very difficult for new people to move here. It has always, I, I have always had a very visceral reaction to that because I lived that rhetoric, especially when I was running for office, you know, as an immigrant woman, et cetera, et cetera. And this is not who we are. And so this SSB gives us an opportunity to, you know, it's, it's not a freebie. It's not as if we're saying, just come in and just build everywhere and then we'll figure out what to do with schools. We are tax, we are applying taxes. We are seeking to have that revenue, but it can, we cannot understate the importance of getting things moving in this county so that we can expand our tax base, that we can provide dignified housing to so many that right now don't have it. That's a very important component as well. And more than anything, to be able to then create jobs, jobs so that people can access opportunities. It is central to a lot of things. And so it's you know very much on point. Those have said that this particular decision is so, I think, central for all of those other particular policy goals that we have in mind. And this is a vision thing. I mean, we can get in the weeds, you know, but. This to me is a vision piece. It's it's about our strategic direction as a county uh, and where do we wanna be in, re in relationship to that. Um, at the same time, recognizing that, you know, investing and funding our infrastructure needs are also critical and important. So I appreciate the conversation. Um, obviously I, I, I support the committees, the majority of the committee's recommendation uh, and again, I think that this is this is a paradigm shift to achieve so many of those policy goals that so many of us have articulated for a long time, and also be frank and honest and recognize that you know the county, by all measure, is kind of in a standstill right now. 
And so there are many different things we need to do. This is one of those pieces that I think we just need to address to get us going. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Jawando. Thank you, um, Mr. President. Um, you know, just a couple points to make here as we as we round the bend. Um, you know, I was reading the, the packet here and uh, related to this discussion, and no one likes the moratorium. You know, uh, and I think we need to be very careful. Uh, you know, we had uh, people stepping up to the line here of, you know, suggesting that there's it's someone on this council, which there isn't, in my view, that's in favor of restricting people from coming to this county uh, or trying to build walls. I, I think you need to, we need to be really careful with that type of language. The intent of this uh, is to say we have to do our job. And it's a and it's a collective we. It's the state. Mr. Governor signed the bill. It's the county. We might we need. I proposed several proposals earlier this year that were didn't make it, but I'm hopeful to come back again next year to increase. Uh, if we increase income tax from 3.2 to 3.5 percent on millionaires in Montgomery County, you get 90 million dollars a year. I just wanted us to have the flexibility to have that discussion. Um, I, we didn't support that. Uh, I've also tried to move to a progressive property tax. There's other bills. So of course we need more revenue, um, but at some point, it's not about whose fault it is. Uh, at, at some point, too much is too much. And, I, and, and, and realizing moratorium is an imperfect tool. And it's really a signal that when we get there, we haven't done our job. We haven't done those other things. And it's not the, uh, it's not the right thing, but I just, I'm frustrated because I don't think we have anything before us today that is the right thing. And so we're going to have to keep uh, moving and trying to address these. But we all want expanded opportunity. I want more commercial business so people can live where they work. I want more two and three bedrooms so more people can live and afford to live in these in these areas that have developed and are developing. And we, we've talked about that. So uh, I, I think we just need to be very careful. I um, and, and on the UPP, which... I started and framed it this way as a kind of a both and, and I think the desired result is hopefully emerging here, um, that, you know, this is about development, just like all of us have to do, paying its share of both the capital cost for the capital infrastructure costs, but also the gener generation of students. I, I don't think it's right to say it's just one thing. Uh, we all have a role to play in the whole pie. And so, uh, so I know we're gonna have that discussion momentarily, uh, but I think those rates need to be much higher, and I propose that, and so I think we'll get into that discussion. Uh, re hearing my colleagues, I don't see the need for a, a vote on this, so I'm going to, with Mr. Rice's approval, I'll withdraw my motion. Um, but, uh, again, no one likes this moratorium, but I would just say, when I bring up these other proposals and when we talk about what we need to do to fund the schools, let's, let's, let's remember this conversation. So uh, with, with, your, with your consent, Mr. Rice, I'll withdraw the motion. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Council, thank you. Council Member Glass, you were on the list. If, would you like anything to add, please? Yeah. Um, I, I appreciate hearing everybody. Um, I, I won't speak to the motion that is no longer on the floor. Um, but, but I just do have some questions that I would love staff to just help, help me understand. Uh, because, you know, we are a welcoming community. Um, we love our diversity. Four of the 10 most diverse cities, communities in the country are here. We want, and that's because we're open and inclusive. Uh, and people come here because of our schools, our incredible schools. And so what, what I'm just trying to figure out uh, as we continue with this conversation, even though this, this motion is not on the floor, um, Director Wright, um, you had talked about other other regions, other counties in the region, and no one else does this. But I'm just curious uh, about two of the, the largest municipalities here in Montgomery County, Rockville and Gaithersburg. Can you share with me and others just how they manage their growth? Well, I may need a little help from uh, Jason because he has met specifically with those two municipalities uh, recently, I believe that at least one of them has set a very, has a moratorium, but has set a very high limit, 150%. Uh, 
Um, Jason, was that Rockville or Gaithersburg? I can't remember. That's Gaithersburg, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and Rockville generally follows what we uh, have put in place, uh, although they've made some modifications to theirs uh, about two years ago, but uh, their moratorium level, I'm pretty sure, is, is fairly consistent with what the county has. Uh, I, I appreciate that. So, so what's the practical effect of Gaithersburg and their 150%? You know, because because where pe my, my colleagues have have stated concerns about economic growth and deterring business, um, and not having revenue, um, and and these are all concerns that I have, which is why I'm genuinely asking these questions. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so what is 150% in, in Gaithersburg? What 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 does that mean? I guess the question is, has Gaithersburg ever actually gone into moratorium? And I don't know the answer to that question. Right, but and what you might find there is, uh, you know, you've got multiple clusters that actually are within the city limits of, of Gaithersburg, right? But you could have, under the current policy that we have in place, a school cluster that goes into moratorium or a school that's in moratorium because we have our threshold right now at 120 percent but gaithersburg would continue to approve development into that cluster because or school because their threshold is higher uh, and i see the council president nodding someone who had, would have intimate knowledge yeah. Yeah. Uh, about this and and what i uh, the three three clusters qo gaithersburg and watkins mill are those the three that are in the city no um the Gaithersburg High School, just as, now there again, this could have changed. The Gaithersburg High School had less students who lived in Gaithersburg going to it than Quince Orchard did. Now there again, that could have changed since, since I'm no longer, you know, with Gaithersburg, but I live in Gaithersburg and not with them. And, and so that in itself is a change. Northwest, uh, certainly there's students from Northwest. To my knowledge, I don't know that anybody right now is going to Watkins Mill. And to the point <laughs> that it, for the schools themselves, very few, I mean, first off, Gatesburg doesn't fund the schools. You know, no, no municipality does, nor can any municipality afford it. But, but the fact that they don't and the fact that not everybody who's in the municipality is going to go to that, that school makes a difference. Yeah. To my memory, the only time Gaithersburg ever went into moratorium was because of the sewer moratorium. And that's because we used WSSC and you couldn't get capacity. And therefore that put us in moratorium, but we didn't do it. And as far as I know, as I say, it could have changed slightly, but as far as I know, we never, we never um, uh, uh, went into moratorium because of schools. And for years, we never had the adequate public facilities ordinance. We never did it. Because we figured we could do it by growth. We figured well, we could do it by planning in, in the growth areas. Well, I, I appreciate the, the firsthand accounting um, of, of what you've all been doing there. And, and Mr. Sartori and, and Director Wright, I, I appreciate that. I mean, because I, I, I was just trying to reconcile the difference between 120% that's currently on the books, 135% is was originally proposed and 140 or 50 or whatever's higher and, and just really what the reality is. And if it seems like 150 uh, hasn't uh, had uh, a more, it hasn't kicked in, um, but it's created some safeguards, right? And and a little, uh, a little more ease knowing that if something were to happen, uh, growth and development wise, that it would be in place, a guardrail, if you will, um, maybe not even a guardrail, maybe just a bumper lane right because it's soft and it's just there and it's malleable um i think there is there is legitimate concern in the community and so just trying to figure this out and of course we have to build housing we're on the record is doing that and so um the the conversation that will come upp chairman Al, uh, council member albernaz you know me uh so i'll save <laughs> that conversation uh for later on in the agenda i'll yield back thank you and and I, I did want to just mention, and I, I also am not in favor of the moratoriums. I, I, I think that they cause more problems than they've ever helped. I, I, and to the point of 150% or whatever it is, you know, whatever the percentage is, somebody says you're not going to stop a growth until 150%. That doesn't make somebody feel comfortable either. And so the reality is, that we need to deal with their problems. If there's a if there's a school that is at when schools are overcrowded, it's not if, it's when. And and 
you know, that is what we have never really done in Montgomery County for for my lifetime. I, I've said this time and time again. I'm going to say it quickly this time. But but my mother went to Gaithersburg, where Gaithersburg Elementary School is now. She was 30 years older than I was. And it was all 12 grades there. That was the only school in Gaithersburg. And there were temporary buildings. They were wooden frame shacks, but they were buildings called temporaries at the school. And she was 30 years older than I am. And when I went to Gaithersburg Elementary, they had built other schools. They, they, uh, the, uh, uh, it was only up to grade six when I went there. Those same temporaries were there. Those temporaries were temporary for over 30 years. And that's what we've done. They're portables is the same idea. But we've never really tackled the problem. We need to work together. We need to work with our, with our partners, the Board of Education and Planning and, and everybody else to tackle the problem and stop saying that we're not going to do it. Just to say you're going to have a moratorium does not tackle the problem. So with that, where are we on this one, Ms. Dunn? Um, um, sorry. Um, yeah, sorry. Ahead, hey, I just have a quick point. Um, trying to answer Mr. Glass's question. Um, on Table 7 of Part 1, there's a chart showing what uh, service areas would be in moratorium at 150% or more, and there's only one in the entire county, what which is uh, page, uh, it's Table 7, I think it's page 18, but the way I print this thing out, it may not be the right page. So it's, it's um, a little further along in the packet. Um, the only uh, uh, service area in the county, which is over 100%, is, a, is Mill Creek Town, which actually is, believe it or not, in the city of Gaithersburg. Um, no, believe it or not, it is not. Well, I just checked the, Mr. Well, Cass, you checked, I just checked, you checked them out. Correctly. Uh, Mill Creek Town is not in Gaithersburg. Um, I see parts, parts of the service area is. Well, but, perhaps, it's, it's perhaps, very, but Mill Creek Town is not in the city. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm saying part of the service area for Mill Creek Town is. But, but it's very man. small. I, I, I don't want to, I don't I'll second this. Mr. Jawanda. Um, I don't, I don't overstate this, but, um, I don't know if there's any development happening there. Okay. I'm just saying that's, uh, if you asked if there's anything in Gaithersburg that would fit under this and part of Mill Creek Town does, um, and in Rockville, uh, of course, uh, currently Rich Montgomery is over 120 percent with a four-year four test, and so it has more implications for Rockville right now. But again, um, you're going to go through lots of other decisions here, and, and by the end, it may not make a difference. That's all. Um, so where I think we are is um, we're at a place where the um, Council could take straw votes on whether or not there's a, a interest in retaining a, a moratorium threshold. Okay. Do we need a motion or is there? Well, don't we have the committee recommendation? The committee majority recommendation is to eliminate moratorium countywide. Okay. What is, I guess we're going to have to vote on this because that was not a unanimous vote in committee, right? I, right. I can make a motion. I'm happy to make okay. a motion. Right. Do that, please. Okay. The, the committee. I move the committee recommendation. It was seconded by Councilmember Friedson. All those in favor of eliminating the moratorium. That's what this committee recommendation would do. Yes. Please raise your hand. So that that is is that everyone? Councilmember Juanda, you're in favor of this as well. We're missing Mr. Rice. Where is Mr. Rice? Mr. Rice, what happened to you? Can we do eight to nothing and he can record? And yeah, why don't we, well, it, right now it's... He's in the matrix. Yeah, well... Let's get him out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Will you text me, Councilman Rice? We can't understand you. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. in. I'm in. in. Yes. Okay. Okay. Very good. Use so the phone. It was the a wall. nine to zero. Is that correct, Councilmember Jawando? You were in favor of removing the moratorium. Okay. I, okay. I just want to be doubly sure. Ms. Dunn, we should probably move on quickly. Is what we should. Do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, the good news is several related recommendations. Um, if a moratorium level was retained, it had to do with exemptions 
for a moratorium. And so I think now we obviously don't need to cover that um, unless somebody feels we should cover it anyway. But if we believe, given this unanimous vote, I think we could move forward, in which case we would then be moving on to talk about the utilization premium payments. Yes. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, the utilization premium payments are recommendation 4.16 in the planning board's draft, um, and they are a fee to be paid by an applicant when a school's projected utilization, according to the planning board, exceeds 120%. Um, and this is very similar to the council members that were here when we had a school facility payment. It was like this utilization premium payment. Um, it is typically based off of some percentage of the impact hacks. And it's a payment made when there's a recognition that a school, when it was a school facility payment, but it was at the cluster level, um, we would now be at the school service area level. But when a school itself is deemed um, overcrowded uh, and that the collection of a fee to contribute to the capital infrastructure for providing more facilities would be something that the council deems is important. Um, in the planning board's draft, they recommended it at 120 for the two school impact areas that would not have moratorium. Um, again, it would also be at 120 actually across the county. Um, but the committee discussed this at length and there were, there were two different recommendations made regarding this. The, um, Council members Friedson and Council member Reamer supported setting the utilization premium payments um, at different percentages. Well, I'll basically say though that the committee as a whole agreed to, so I'll set that up first because it can get complicated. They did agree that there were three tiers. So they unanimously agreed that at 105% of utilization, there should be a utilization premium payment. They differed on what that percentage would be. At 120%, they also agreed there should be a utilization premium payment but again, at different percentages. And then again, at 135, um, council members Reamer and Friedson suggested a third level utilization premium payment. Council member Juwando suggested a moratorium. My guess is now what the council has before them is um, at least a unanimous vote by the committee to have three different tiers for the utilization premium payments at 105, 120, and 135. And so now it needs to be um, discussed as what should those payment premiums be set at? Um, the majority of the committee had suggested that at 105% of utilization, the premium be set at 20% of the applicable impact tax for the school level that is overutilized. So I wanna be a little clear, this is a complicated um, payment to talk about in a sense. It is based off the impact tax, but it is not like a straight 20% of the impact tax because you also have to view it at the school level that is overutilized. And the impact tax is for the all three school levels. So. Um, we have charts. I sent out an addendum today. We had made a calculation error in some of the tables that were in the staff draft. So in the addendum, so it's a really small little document you could open, but it has the committee proposed impact tax rates updated using the correct student generation rates we had miscalculated. And then it has the utilization tables at these different percentages, what they would look like by school level and by structure type. Um, so Let's re, uh, regroup here. The committee had recommended at 105% that premium payment be set at 20% of the applicable uh, rate. Um, at 120% that the payment be set at uh, 40% and when you reached 135% utilization, that UPP would be set at 60%. That was recommended by council members Reamer and Friedson. Council member Jawando recommended that at 105% the utilization premium payment would be 50%. And when you reached 120%, which is currently now our moratorium threshold in the county, countywide, that you would pay 100% of that utilization premium payment. Again, it would be at the school level that is deemed inadequate. It would only be if all three school levels were inadequate would this utilization premium payment actually equal the impact tax. I'll try to make that clear. It's not, um, it's not uncomplicated. Um, so that's, that's before the council now is uh, you can have a discussion whether you want to agree with the three different thresholds, 105, 120, 135, and then take up the, the premium percentage amounts. Okay. Uh, Mary Beck uh, wanted to speak. Ms. Beck? Yes, I did, I did just want to comment, and I know we're going to get into the larger impact text picture probably on Friday. 
Um, but as has been noted in general, most of the decisions here are going in a negative direction in terms of revenues. <clears throat> and the, the UPP is a lot like the old school facility payments. And in the past, what was done in the last um, subdivision staging policy was there was the bump up of the 20% that was added to impact tax rates. And it was designed to replace the school facility payments as well as take into account the fact that there was no cost for land included in the per student cost calculation. And I think the challenge with the UPP is that this money is less than what we would have gotten with the other 20% or with many of the other uh, reductions that are occurring through the process so far. It's a lot less predictable and less stable and it's less programmable. I can't assume I'm going to get it and and use that to project forward. So that means that we have to do what we did with the old school facility payments. And Glenn will remember this. We have to wait around till the money comes in, make sure we got a project that we can use it in. It makes it a lot harder to program money for the CIP. And I know that when we look back historically in the time that we had had the 20% bump up, it was about $4.6 million a year on average. Uh, when we look at the planning board's recommendation for the UPP, which was actually higher, I think, than where the committee landed, we would have been down by about 1.6 million in over six years. That's enough to pay for an elementary school addition. So I'm just concerned that this moves us in a direction where we're going to have problems paying for the projects we want to we want to do. Um, we need all these revenue sources working together because development is certainly not responsible for all the growth, but it is certainly responsible for some of the growth. And with other exemptions and things that we're going to talk about later, um, we're just ending up in a position that's going to make it hard for us to do everything we want to do for schools. Okay. Thank you. Council Member Jawanda. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. And thank you, Ms. Black. Uh, I have a question that I think will implicate you and maybe planning. Um, but I wanted, I think it's an important point that we all need to think about is that the general trend of this proposal and other proposals before us, and I understand the theory of the case here, you know, under the planning board's proposal, but it's going to account with for less revenue and more, un more unstable revenue, as you just mentioned. Um, and you know, so that's a that's just a consideration, and I understand everything's a trade-off, right? Um, and I had a question about the fiscal estimates that you that you all presented to us in the that are at the basis of the packet. Um, the so the, the estimates that we were given for impact fees are based on historical data, right? And so that wouldn't that only be accurate if the new tax rates fail to generate additional housing units above or beyond the recent averages and if they generate more development that the revenue losses could could potentially be higher uh and uh, even though we still have to incur the cost of classrooms does, does that make sense to, to, do, you, do you get that question yes it does um and that that's a true statement and i think in the fiscal impact statement um what what omv did and Oh, Ben can jump in if there's more technical questions. But what uh, we looked at was two things. We looked at <clears throat> history and we looked at the pipeline. And I mean, one of the things I think I mentioned before was one of the things that concerned us with the change to the regional rates is that, um, you know, if development does not take place at the level that's uh, indicated in Clarksburg, We've, we sort of put a lot of our eggs in that basket. Rates have gone down elsewhere, but they're going up in Clarksburg. So if we don't get the development in Clarksburg, our losses on revenues could be even greater. So um, yes, the, the rate structure makes a difference. And you, you are correct. If we had higher rates, the revenue losses would be higher. Okay. Um, and then I guess the the, I just wanted to give a brief, you know, make a proposal, and I know we'll have a lot of, you know, Miss Dunn laid it out, and I th and thank you for explaining the extremely technical part about the what the payment is actually, the percentage of of the impact tax, and so I had proposed 
uh, 50 percent at 105 and 100 percent at 120. And I would just modify now that we've made the decision, which I supported to eliminate the moratorium. I would just say that for 135, uh, we should go to 150 percent. So I'd like to 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 move that as a uh, a starting a starting bid. Uh, and then um, obviously we can have have discussion on that. It was moved by Council Member Jawando. Is there a second? If there's a second, I don't know. Second for purposes of discussing this. Thank you. Okay. And, and, I, and that was my purpose, Mr. Chairman, to, I, I don't think, it doesn't have to land there, but my point being, I think, you know, we should start there. I'm open to friendly amendments, want to hear what people think. And I just think we need to have it higher, especially now that there's no more tour and we've made that decision. And Ms. Dunn has explained what this cost is for. I think these payments should be higher. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Friedson. Yeah, I appreciate this. I think we should discuss you know, where this lands. The committee ultimately uh, landed what I think is a, a reasonable approach. Uh, 20% at uh, 105, we lowered it significantly from the planning board's recommendation at 120%. Uh, which is uh, where uh, is the only trigger that currently exists is at 120% uh, capacity, uh, 40% um, um, and, and 60%. So, um, you know, I, I think that we have to strike a balance here. And I think that the balance that we have to do is to make sure that we aren't eliminating moratorium in a policy and creating a different moratorium by other, another day and by making the premium payments so high that we both get no new housing and generate no new revenue. The very issue with moratorium for why we eliminated it is why we have to be very sensitive and thoughtful and methodical on what we do here, because if we set the rates at an unreasonable level, we won't generate more revenue, we'll generate no revenue and get no new housing and get no new investment and turn away the very residents we want to be attracting uh, into our community. The entire basis for the unanimous vote uh, we just took, which was momentous uh, in terms of the policy direction that this council and this county uh, is heading, which I think is a welcome uh, development. I think it's important to note the idea of revenue loss when it comes to impact taxes is a little odd to me when it comes to this discussion. 100% cost of a student is, by my math, 100% of the cost of the student. So the idea that we are giving up revenue by only charging the full cost of that student is not consistent with what the decision is that we are making. By definition, the, the premium payment is the premium on top of the cost of a student that we are charging to new housing in order to pay for existing issues, existing school overcrowding, existing challenges and at a certain point, that's reasonable, and I can understand it and appreciate it, but at, you get to a certain point where you are overcharging for that amount and you are penalizing the new resident uh, for the uh, issues created by the existing residents. And that is precisely what we're trying to get out of and precisely what we're trying uh, to avoid. So I would, would hope that, uh, you know, I think this particular proposal is extremely high. Um, uh, and I, I think that the uh, committee recommendation, which uh, took the planning board's recommendation and lowered it to 105% uh, to start these payments, which I think is appropriate to make sure that we're doing what we're trying to do, which is to generate the resources that we want and need uh, for our schools. I think that is, uh, that is critical. And I think uh, it's separate from this conversation. Uh, you know, Ms. Beck raised a lot of points in her, uh, in, 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 in her comments. But uh, one of the significant points there is whether or not we believe it's appropriate to charge more than the cost of a student for impact taxes. The point of impact taxes is supposed to be to pay for the cost of a student. And while I appreciate what Ms. Beck is saying, and she's not wrong in terms of a math question, 120 is by definition more than 100. There's no doubt about that. The question is, is it appropriate to charge a premium for a new student to come to Montgomery County? Is it, is it, should we, should we do that? 
is that is that a reasonable public policy for us to take? I would say emphatically no. I think our data today is far better than it was when we have previously taken taken this up. I think that we are uh, we have uh, student generation numbers. I think that the GEO committee was uh, uh, very thoughtful in the way that it handled the cost of a student being the cost of a student. I think the Fed committee on uh, this particular case was very reasonable based off of this, and I uh, hope that the full council will uh, adopt what the Fed committee recommendation uh, was for the uh, UPPs. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Dunn, did you want to discuss the seat deficit You're on mute. There you go. Sorry about that. Um, before we move forward uh, to get too far into talking about like what percentages um, should be set at each of these thresholds, I was hoping the council could at least weigh in on a straw vote. One, are you um, in agreement with the committee recommendation for the three thresholds? It was unanimous. My guess is you are, but to have you um, take your straw vote on that. But there was another piece that I missed to inform you about and before we get too far away from it. Not only is the utilization premium payment based on this uh, utilization threshold as a percentage, um, but it has a corresponding seat deficit that is based on program capacity associated with it as well. And it's very much what we do now with respect to a moratorium. There is a 120% utilization threshold for moratorium, but it has a corresponding seat deficit related to it. And that's because we have schools of all different sizes in the county. And while you may be at 122% in one part of the county, um, if it's a very small school, you may be so far below the seat deficit that MCPS starts to program for capacity problems, um, it doesn't make sense to uh, consider that. So they work together, the seat deficit threshold and the utilization rate, um, and it's in your draft. It's on page uh, 22 is a chart that shows both, and I've, um, we reviewed this with the uh, committee. They were uh, unanimously in support of the seat deficit threshold as well. But I just wanted you to have that before you as you take your straw votes. We didn't skip it. Okay, thank you. Council Member Reamer. Thank you. Um, okay, well, I, I just wanted to really speak for the committee's recommendation. I, I think we have a motion uh, for a different recommendation, um, but for the sake of my colleagues who are trying to figure out how they're gonna vote on on the motion for this, uh, you know, bottom of page 23 lays out pretty clearly, you know, in a table, when a school exceeds 105%, there is a payment that is equal to an additional bump of 20% on the impact tax. When a school exceeds 120%, it's 40%. And when a school exceeds 135%, it's 60%. So, uh, you will see a fair amount of utilization of the 20% bump. Um, but uh, so, you know, I think people can feel like this charge is being applied. Um, you know, this is not like a, unlike a, a moratorium at a, you know, at a level that doesn't get used. This, this is something that will get used. Um, and at the same time, as we all know, you know, the school system really doesn't, this is very likely make changes to a school at, at 110 percent or 105 um, percent. You know, they don't consider that to be like very problematically crowded. I think that they would prefer that it was less. But, you know, generally speaking, if they think it'll get to 120, then they'll really put something in motion. But if this is something that's just at 105 or 110, it's not considered to be you know, such a big problem that it requires, you know, millions of dollars of, of change. And yet we will be collecting, you know, a tax, uh, uh, you know, nevertheless, uh, we'll be collecting a premium uh, in those cases. So um, I think the committee recommended a very reasonable path to charge a premium, uh, to collect additional tax when there's development that wants to go where schools are crowded at the same time without relying on either moratorium or a level of tax that was intended to, you know, stop the development from happening. You know, I, we should have a clean policy, like either it, we're going to allow it or we're not going to allow it. And if we're going to allow it, we can charge more, but not try to charge so much that it can't happen. If, you know, if we don't want it to happen, then we should just have a moratorium. Thanks. Thank you. 
Ms. McGuire, I see you on the the uh, call. Did you want to comment? You're on mute, so there you go. Thank you. And I just came on in case there was a question, but I would just like to emphasize that one of the reasons that we, we certainly support the seat deficit as a as a uh, measure as well, um, in in large part also because of course percentages can differ very very much in terms of the experience at a school. Um, so it is important to look at both. Um, one of the reasons that those seat deficits are where they are is because if it's really just one or two classrooms, certainly we're not gonna come to council and ask for major construction for a, um, a small addition of one to two classrooms. So that that is really, I just did wanna, uh, certainly we would look for another way to address that overcapacity and relocatables can be um, a good solution if it is temporary or sometimes there are other ways to accommodate in the building, but it really does speak to sort of where is that threshold for major construction, um, as opposed to a threshold where we need to monitor the trends more carefully and deal with smaller trends um, without, again, incurring major construction costs. Okay, thank you. Council Member Rice. And it's my understanding he is on the phone that's right. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Yep. Yep. Thank you. So for me, um, this is another one where there is no exact landing that seems to be clear. Uh, it seems as though the, and I'm not sure if this was joint committee or uh, ed committee, um, came up with some numbers and think that that may work. Have, have we looked at what the pass through, and so this is more towards Jason and Pam, um, with the pass through and the additional expenditure and council member Reamer kind of touched on this uh, in terms of impact of affordability will be on the units themselves. Uh, that was part of, so we can at least give you the, the tables that were in the addendum for today, give you per unit what those costs would be by the different um, school impact areas and different structure types. Um, we also have, and I, uh, we were hesitant to pull it up today because we're still kind of working on things, um, but I will mention, uh, Mr. Sartori did create an amazing um, spreadsheet that allows you to um, basically create any scenario you want related to these items. And so um, it shows the, plant, the current, you know, what the current revenue stream is from the different aspects of all of these pieces what the planning board recommendation is, what the committee recommendation is. And then he, he is he is amazing. He created a third column, another column that is, um, if you wanna tweak things and what does that look like? And so um, maybe, maybe a good place for today, if we're gonna cover impact taxes on Friday, is to just say, can we at least vote on that there are these thresholds that everyone agrees to the thresholds and the seat deficit. And we can bring to you, I don't know that there's time today because I know you have other items, um, but we can pull up that interactive spreadsheet to allow you to see how do these then pieces really work together. It is sort of as Councilmember Navarro had wanted is that quote scenario building um, and it'll provide you with an ability to see these things. Okay. Was there anything else Councilmember Rice? No, I would just say that I agree with that. And I think that that would be a uh, best uh, way for us to move forward because from my perspective, I'm just not sure what landing at what number is going to mean. There's some justification on going on both sides. I will just remind folks, this is very similar to the conversation about Clarksburg. And if we're gonna talk about housing affordability, we can't pretend as though we didn't just have this conversation about uh, the affordability of housing in Clarksburg with regards to what we're gonna talk about on Friday. So I just wanted to just put that out there that the same sort of conversation is what I was saying about what it is that we were going to be doing with some of our decisions regarding Greenfield. So anyway, thanks. Thank you. Council Member Auburn Oz. Um, well, I, I appreciate the recommendation from Ms. Dunn. I, I think you articulated something I had floating in my head, but that that, that is good. Um, that, that would be really helpful to look at those respective scenarios because I'm sensitive to not creating a moratorium by a different name. Get that completely. Um, also get that we don't want to make this at such a high level that it dissuades development. I just don't feel equipped to know what that sweet spot is. Uh, and, and that is where I would love some guidance from planning as well in comparisons to other jurisdictions. You know, and, and as you mentioned, Gwen, 
every jurisdiction is wrestling with this. Uh, and so, and you had mentioned in Alexandria, some options and recommendations. I'm not sure how consistent those are with what we're talking about right now, or whether there's uh, that threshold, that concept, now that we're moving away from moratoriums, what that might look like. Um, but I think an economic assessment would be helpful for me um, so that, you know, uh, we, we don't want to go too low, we don't want to go too high. Um, and then seeing how it compares, as Ms. Dunn mentioned, to that cascading effect for other impact taxes, I think is also very helpful. So um, I like the direction we're going in and gathering more information. And that's an additional data point that I would need before I feel comfortable deciding on whether Councilmember Jawando's proposal is too high or Councilmember Friedson and Reamers is too low. I just don't know. And I don't feel equipped to make that decision right now just without some kind of economic analysis. Thank you, Councilmember Jawando. The pores is too hot. It's too cold. It's just right. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I think you that do makes, story time, don't you? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, I, I think that's. I agree with that, and and so I don't. I don't. We don't have to withdraw. I can withdraw it, or we can just take it, or just pause and come back to it when we come back to this point. But I think that's a, for the especially for the benefit of folks who need to look at the numbers and. And that'll be helpful. And, and as I said, I'm not wedded to this exact proposal. I think it is, um, I don't think it's too high. I think development will still move forward. Again, the overall trajectory of this is to go down. And um, there's the fact that there's no cap on where you, where you can build now because of the moratorium, I think. So I, I, I think, I don't, I don't think even at this level or higher, it would discourage, but it's a good point for colleagues. So I'm Mr. President, I'm happy to, uh, withdraw for now and, and then come back to it when we uh, have that information. Okay. Council Member Arbonaz, you agree with that as well. Thank you. Council Member Glass, you would seem to be right I, after the motion's I, gone. Here comes Council Member Glass. I, I, I miss the day so you know where you're going to be in, you know, in the yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and uh, I, I don't know what it means that I continue to be after uh, Mr. Jawando uh your bat and cleanup is what that is. There you go. Uh, right, uh, takes his motion off the floor. Um, but but I, I do agree with where uh, Councilmember Albernaz was going. Um, you know, we do need a little more economic data. Uh, you know, and whether and and really are, we are in the quest for Goldilocks. That's that's what it is. Uh, we got to figure out how to do right by our students, who are in overcrowded schools, and we need to figure out how to help pay for this. Okay. That's it. I yield Thank back. You. Thank you. Council Member Freitz. Yeah, just quickly on uh, Council Member Albernaz's uh, suggestion, I just think it would be important from planning to make sure that the data that uh, planning looked at, that we've looked at uh, in terms of regional comparisons on impact taxes would be really helpful uh, to that. And I think uh, speaks to uh, some of what Council Member Albernaz uh, was saying. I think that's an important piece. I mean, at least theoretically, it shouldn't call it, cost us dramatically more to uh, build a bike lane or to uh, build school capacity than it does of uh, many of our regional uh, counterparts. Uh, and so I think that should be uh, part of this uh, as well and uh, look forward to following up and continuing this conversation and uh, hopefully land uh, in, in an appropriate place. Thank you, Council Member Reamer. Thank you. Um, I, I, I know that this is like, there's sort of a blizzard of information um, but uh, you know, this one, when, when you kind of settle on it, it it's pretty simple. Uh, I do think the committee recommendation, um, you know, is a good one. Uh, when a school exceeds 105%, then the payment would be a 20% premium on the impact taxes. Uh, when the school exceeds 120%, it would be a 40% premium on the impact taxes. Um, you know, that, that's a pretty substantial payment and it is, uh, you know, anyway, it's just a pretty substantial payment. So there, there's a final tier at 135%, which I would hope that that would never have to be used, frankly, um, you know, uh, which is 60% uh, premium on the impact taxes. So um I, I, I leave my colleagues with that. It's on the bottom of page 23. I think it's a very reasonable framework that uh, does indeed charge a pretty hefty premium. 
Thank you. Mary Beck. Yes, just, just one comment. I, I think when the planning board's looking at the impact taxes, we just need to keep in mind that there are oftentimes proper systems in Virginia that um, would need to be thought through as well. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Navarro. Thank you. Uh, in the addendum that was sent um, today, there are also <clears throat> a couple of tables that for my colleagues that wanted that additional information, it would be good to look it over. Table 13, 14, and 15, 16 also have the particular amounts for single family and multifamily. So as everybody is trying to look at what this might actually um, be in terms of dollars, uh, it it shows you right there. Um, you know, I'm comfortable with what the majority of the committee came up with. Again, this is on top of, you know, this is actually a premium. That's what we're talking about. Um, and so to me, that was com that was a comfortable place to land. Um, but, you know, I'm happy to entertain the additional information um, because at the end of the day, as it was stated, what we want to do here is strike that balance, uh, but not, inadvertently create another moratorium scenario by going too high. But um, but in the meantime, I just wanted to point out that those tables are there uh, in the addendum and they do provide the specific amounts in dollars that uh, would be charged uh, under those scenarios. Thank you. Thank you. So go ahead, Jason. Sure. I just wanted to also point out that, and I can uh, send this, make sure that uh, Ms. Dunn has this to, to distribute, but uh, Appendix I from the Planning Board's recommendation is all about a comparison with other jurisdictions, and Table 1 in that appendix has a, a comparison of school impact taxes with other uh, local jurisdictions, so you can see those there. Okay. Thank you. So, Ms. Dunn, at this point, I think what we're going to, is just where we're putting in the bookmark and we'll come back to it on Friday. Is that what is being, are you comfortable with that? I am, as long as you will take a straw vote on the threshold being 105, 120, 135 with an accompanying seat deficit set of the program capacity level. You're saying to do that on Friday or to do that now? On, do that now. Well, I don't know that Councilmember Auburnaz was comfortable with that. Were you? Yeah. Well, I, I'm comfortable with there being three thresholds. Um, and I'm comfortable with seat capacity, but what that specific threshold is, is oh. still what I want to no, For debate, whether it's 105, 120, 135. Okay, that's fine. No, 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 I, I don't think that's what. I think he was fine I, with the thresholds, not fine with the payment amounts. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think yeah. we're all on the same okay. page. Right. I think Ms. Dunn's recommendation originally is for us to vote on the things that were not debated significantly and were not uh, c contentious during committee and then discard those and then keep the, what should the amounts be at each of the three thresholds, which is still up for discussion. Correct. So, so it's fair to say, is it fair to say, not to be thoroughly more confusing, that, that we were a vote on the 105, 120, and 135 without just that those are the thresholds mm -hmm. and then not get into the weeds of those at this point. Is that what we're With suggesting? the accompanying C capacity. Okay. And, and the seat capacity, right. So if that is what we're after, I think, then that is without objection. Is that correct? Yeah. All right, I see. Ms. Dunn certainly is not objecting, so. <laughs> okay, then that is where we are. Thank you, it's a, without objection. And we are going to put a bookmark in and, uh, and then move on to a, a next item on our agenda which, might I add, is only four minutes past two here as to the suggested time. Not, not that I'm uh, keeping score, but we're next, now going to move to the district. Thank you all very much, and Ms. Dunn and, and, and Dr. Orland and everybody else who's been associated with this. This is, as you know, not the easiest uh, um, topic that we've ever dealt with, but we will be back on Friday on this. And uh, now we're going to move to the district council section session. And there's an introduction for zoning text amendment 20-04, farming defined, accessory mulching and com composting. The lead sponsor is council member Glass. Co-sponsors are council member Friedson, Reamer and Albernaz. And council member Navarro would like to speak, please. 
you're on mute. Mary. I would rather have uh, Councilmember Glass speak. I just wanted to point out for the record that I'm I'm one of the co sponsors, but it was not reflected in the packet. Okay. As am I, I believe. I and and, I'm yeah, and I think also Councilmember Rice, I think also was supposed to be on there. Yeah. Thank you for looking out for me, Councilmember Navarro. <laughs> And I would I like think to we're supposed to be co-lead sponsors, but somehow we got <laughs> I appreciate you. And I would like to be included as well. So who's ever keep and Vice President Hucker, I think we just got a unanimous on that. So at, at any rate, uh Mr. I, I Council Member Glass, did you want to speak first and then ask Mr. Zions or vice versa? Uh sure, I'd like to speak uh and, and appreciate the the robust uh, agreement here uh, amongst everybody. I know that there were some concerns with the packet and the timeliness of everything. Uh, and I know that Mr. Zients um, did his best to reflect the ever-changing nature of, of this particular ZTA. So thank you for updating it to the best you could. Uh, and I know that it'll be updated even more so after, after this introduction. But let me just take a step back here. Uh, you know, here in Montgomery County, we believe in science, we believe in data, and we believe that ch climate change is man-made. And that part about climate change being man-made is important because here in Montgomery County, we generate 147,000 tons of food waste every year. And that's a lot of food waste. So the question is, where does all of that go? And the vast majority of our food waste here is actually sent to the incinerator in Dickerson where it's burned to ashes, which is dirty and a preventable process at that. So Montgomery County does have a partnership with our neighbors in Prince George's County to use their composting facility. Uh, and the Department of Economic uh, Environmental Protection has a pilot project to also help with econ uh, commercial business composting. But the county doesn't have a meaningful way to address the sheer amount of food waste that we generate every single year. So after nearly a year of conversations with farmers, scientists, and environmentalists, I'm excited to introduce the Zoning Text Amendment 24, which helps increase the productivity of on-farm composting and mulching. And it does so by raising the limit on how much farms can accept from off-site sources, which is currently at 20%, but this ZTA would increase it to 50%. And, you know, at its core, we know that farmers want composting because composting is farming. And by increasing the amount of food scraps our farms can accept, it means that we produce more compost and mulch instead of that scrap being sent to the incinerator. And this is not only an environmental effort, but it really will help create green jobs here in Montgomery County. Our local agriculture industry generates $154 million every year, and we can expect that to increase as these efforts also grow. You know, we already have farmers ready to accept more food waste, and we have local entrepreneurs ready to expand their business. So this is literally shovel ready. Uh, it's good for farmers, it's good for residents, it's good for the economy, and ultimately it's good for the planet. You know, many of you know that that my husband, Jason, is a horticulturalist, uh, and we like to get to the root of, of these issues. And so we've been composting in our backyard for years, uh, and I know people regularly shrug uh, at me when I tell them that, but composting is a valuable part of our ecosystem. It sequesters carbon, it reduces reliance on chemical pesticides and fertilizers, and it also helps prevent uh, nutrient runoff. So it's a whole lot of good in a whole little package. And so uh, I would like to uh, thank my co-leads, Councilmember Friedson and Councilmember Navarro. Uh, if uh, I, I don't know where Councilmember Rice is, if, if he is co-leading, that is excellent as the three of you uh, are the district council members for much of the farming capacity here in Montgomery County. County. Uh, and I also want to thank Council Members Reamer, Albernaz, and Jawando for co-sponsoring as well. But although I, I heard Council Member Hucker and uh, President Katz also uh, in before I made those comments. So, uh, so thank you all. And then finally, I, I really do want to thank two members of my team. Uh, first is my legislative aide, uh, David Lorenzo Boteo, uh, for all of his di diligent work digging in to the science and research in this. Uh, and then also my chief of staff, Valeria Carranza, uh, who actually came back from her alma mater and shared with me the farming composting program that they did there. 
and that's when we really uh, that that's when we really took it to task here to see what we could do. So uh, last, I'll just say that we are really enthusiastic about uh, farm to table living here in Montgomery County, and with this CTA, hopefully, we will also be enthusiastic about table to farm composting. So with that, uh, I yield back, Mr. President, and thank you all. Thank you very much, and I'm going to uh, turn to Mr. Science and. Uh, he has something to say. I also just wanted to point out, though, you know, while we're doing this, we should call on our partners with Montgomery County Public Schools because they should be a part of this formula as well, whether it's in this legislation or in some other form. But we've been working on that they should be doing composting, and I think it's very necessary that our students learn it from the earliest age. Uh, Mr. I was going to call you Council Member Zions. Mr. Zions, who's not a council member. No, no, that would be Glenn Orland, who's the only staff council member. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, I, I can appreciate that. Yes, go I, ahead. I just want to make sure I have the bidding correctly. Um, I have as lead sponsors, council member Glass, Friedson, uh, Navarro, and now um, Mr. R uh, council member Rice. And then as co-sponsors, uh, council member uh, uh, Reamer, Albanaz, Jawando, um, Katz and and Hucker. Do okay. I have that correct? I think you got them all. If you're up to nine, you got them all. If you have ten, Jeff, you got too many. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Council Member Friedson. Appreciate that. I'm glad we got that uh, squared away. Um, I um, appreciate Council Member Glass and now all colleagues. Um, for uh, uh, work on this, and, and Council Members Navarro and, uh, and Rice, so I get to share the, the Agricultural Reserve uh, with. And, and you know, this is not uh, an individual effort. This is part of an ongoing effort that this council and the prior council have really taken leadership on in terms of composting and zero waste, and uh, certainly building upon uh, those uh, efforts and uh, working together and collaboratively with the executive branch as well. And Adam Ortiz has been a leader in the region uh, on these issues. And one of the reasons why I was so excited when he was uh, brought in here to bring some of the innovation that he brought to Prince George's County to uh, Montgomery County. But this particular proposal is an absolute win-win. I mean, most of these issues that we deal with uh, get caught up in being zero-sum games. And this is a perfect example that they're not. Uh, and this is about proving how we can benefit our environment and our sustainability goals and also uh, support the local small business owners who are the foundation uh, of our county's economy, helping our uh, family-owned agricultural operations uh, financially, uh, and uh, making sure that we uh, keep compostable materials out of the waste stream. Uh, currently, Montgomery County produces 147,000 tons of food waste per year. Uh, it is generated uh, in so many different places, in so many uh, different uh, ways, uh, increasing the amount of off-site material that farmers can use in manufacturing of compost and mulch uh, is a significant step in the right direction, one of many efforts that we have to undertake uh, in order to uh, address these uh, vexing challenges. And I'm very pleased to be a part of this effort to uh, work together with colleagues, with our agricultural community, with the executive branch uh, to move forward on the ambitious goals that we have to reduce uh, the waste uh, in our food, uh, in, in our uh, waste stream, and to uh, make sure that we are moving towards uh, the zero waste goals uh, that we've ambitiously set for ourselves for the sake of uh, our uh, environment. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rice. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. I want to thank Councilmember Glass. You know, this was really something I wanted to make sure, you know, when it was first introduced to us. Uh, that our food council and our farmers were on board. And I really want to thank council member glass for his collaboration with all of them in certainly making this happen. Um, Mr. Katz, I did want to respond to something that you said about uh, Montgomery County public schools, which is something that my office has been keenly working on. We do have composting projects at Montgomery Blair high school and a few others. There are a few middle schools that are already doing composting as well. And in fact, there were a number of middle school students who actually did a video uh, and public service announcement on composting and really spearheaded some of the efforts in getting composting done in schools across uh, the county. And so from that perspective, I do think that there's a synergy there that needs to happen uh, when it comes to making sure that we can uh, align ourselves with uh, 
projecting these these composting policies that will certainly make a difference uh, when it comes to our overall uh, greenhouse gas emission goals, uh, but then also when it comes to just really doing the right thing and making sure that our children play a role uh, in shaping their future. And so really appreciative, again, of all the leadership uh, from Councilmember Glass and uh, happy to be a co-sponsor. Thank you, Councilmember Reamer. Thank you. Uh, glad to support this. Uh, I'm really pleased to see it moving forward. Uh, I think this is one of the more challenging ways that we can actually create a, a local market to receive, uh, you know, compost, uh, raw compost, I guess. So um, it may allow property owners there to, um, you know, start, it does allow property owners there to start receiving um, and then it'll make it more possible for uh, county residents or businesses or our schools, whatever, to have a, a place close by to uh, process uh, compost waste. So, um, you know, it's part of turning uh, what grows out of the ground to the ground. And uh, I'm, I'm glad to see it moving forward. Uh, you know, thank you to Councilmember Glass and uh, all the co-sponsors and leads for bringing it forward. Thank you, Councilmember Navarro. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk again. I wanted to make sure the Councilmember Glass had the first uh, word here since it says Bill. But I really do appreciate uh, his leadership uh, and also the opportunity to um, to sponsor this important, uh, you know, proposal. I mean, we are constantly looking at ways to support our agricultural reserve, our farmers, to find uh, ways that we can intersect a lot of what is needed in terms of more activity and more opportunities for uh self-sufficiency for revenue, but at the same time address many of the important issues such as our environmental goals here. Uh, so this to me, it's a really wonderful opportunity to enhance that and uh, and to also make sure that we can integrate a lot of our young people in uh, continually understanding how everything makes a real big difference. So um, just really uh, thank you, Council Member Glass and, and thank everybody for uh, being a part of this as well. Thank you. And let me also congratulate Council Member Glass. He did a wonderful job on this. This is for introduction. All, all of this applause was strictly for the introduction. We can imagine what the vote will be on uh, Council Member Glass. <laughs> but um, we, this is going to go to public hearing, and it's scheduled for December 1st at 1.30 p.m. So thank you. Uh, next, we're going to uh, go to... Uh, legislative day number 31, miscellaneous business, and it's consideration of county executives veto of bill 2920, taxation, payment in lieu of taxes, the WMATA property. And I've had people ask me, what is the WMATA property? It is Metro. We know it is Metro, but it's the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority. So therefore it's called WMATA, but it is Metro property established. And, um, I guess we need to turn to Mr. Drummer first, and then I'll go to Council Member Reamer uh, next. But Mr. Drummer, are you going to explain the process to us, please? Sure, be happy to. Uh, you enacted the bill on October 16th. The executive uh, disapproved it on October 16th. And the council has 60 days from the receipt of the disapproval to vote to reenact it over the executive's veto. Uh, the consideration before you is either an up or down vote. You can't amend the bill now. You can simply uh, override the veto or not. It requires six votes to override the veto and uh, the executive's reasons for vetoing the bill are in the packet in his memorandum. And um, the actual uh, discussion of the issues is in the packet too. I included the action packet that was before you on October 6th, if you want to refer to any of the issues. And that's what's before you. Thank you very much, Council Member Reamer.
Thank you, Mr. Council President. Uh, first, I want to thank you for scheduling uh, this uh, legislative moment so quickly. I uh, really appreciate that. Um, I, I would like to make a motion to override the executive's veto, um, and I will uh, just share some comments about why uh, I think that is the right action for us to take. Um, you know, the the law that we passed uh, is highly targeted to nine metro station properties, uh, and those properties could be delivering enormous benefits to this county, uh, including substantial tax revenues, but they aren't. Uh, instead, they're a drag. Uh, some of them are nearly brownfields because of the incredible cost of building on them, and they have sat undeveloped for decades, for decades. Uh, we have a plan to break the status quo and to generate momentum and um, the legislation that we passed, which unfortunately was vetoed, uh, would really enable the county to have a chance to move forward and start to collect tax revenue from these properties, but even more significantly, to transform what is generally a empty parking lot or a parking garage, not empty, used parking lot and a used parking garage, into a place, into a community hub, into somewhere that people live, that people work, that companies may want to locate, uh, that provides parks, urban parks, you know, performance spaces, restaurants, all the benefits of smart growth that we know we want on our metro station properties, but that we have been unsuccessful in decades in generating. Um, we are facing a housing shortage, as we discussed earlier today. Um, we have, this plan has the potential to generate as many as 8,500 new housing units, uh, including 12 to 1,300 of them uh, set aside in our county's affordable programs. Um, but if we don't pass this incentive, I truly believe we will not get that housing for years, decades, or longer, perhaps never. Um, this plan that we've passed will not only deliver housing, but office building sites, shopping destinations, uh, so many other key quality of life, uh, you know, indicators that our community is really seeking. And uh, so I really urge my colleagues to uh, support the override we have, a, we have a solution at hand for housing, for climate change. Uh, we will never tackle climate change without more housing at transit so there's less pollution from driving. For transportation, uh, producing less traffic with our housing and with our development. For economic development, uh, you know, the entire red line can be a corridor and it can be marketed as a corridor for life science companies and technology workers. And this structured but very targeted incentive can bring the private sector to the table at a scale that has not yet been possible. Um, so there is so much potential here. If we do not take this action, I, I really believe that these metro station properties will remain as they are for the indefinite future and we will regret that tremendously five years, 10 years, 20 years down the road when they look the same as they look now. And the investment that we seek is taking place in other communities. So uh, I will again move the override of the veto. Okay, it's been moved by council member Reamer. Is there a second? Second. It's been seconded by council member Friedson. Council member Jawando. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and I appreciate that we're having this discussion again. Um, one of the advantages of being an at-large member is that I get to hear from all residents all across the county. Um, and as I've said before, I take very seriously my responsibility and our collective responsibility to be stewards of public resources um, and ensuring that taxpayer money is not only used in the best interest of taxpayers, uh, but also in, the, in a way that supports uh, workers when it's related to building, as, as this is. Uh, when taxpayers' dollars are used or foregone, in this instance, to, to support private development projects, 
the county must establish policies that support fair wages and protect the interests of taxpayers. Uh, bill 2920 is a complex bill. It has a good and laudable goal, which uh, I agree with the stated goal that we need to increase our housing stock and we need the opportunity to do that near transit in a transit oriented way. A very good goal, something that I think is, is pretty much universal agreement on. The, the details obviously are important. At the same time, it authorizes a pilot, a payment in lieu of taxes that would exempt 100% of the real property taxes that would otherwise be levied for a period of 15 years. 100% 15 years. Beginning in the, in, in the year that the use and occupancy permit is issued for that qualifying development. This exemption spread across multiple WMATA, and as you pointed out, Mr. President, which equals Metro properties over a number of years, has the potential for the county to forego tens of millions of dollars in revenue. Um, and even though we did add a sunset provision of 2032, uh, any existing pilot would continue to the end of its 15 year lease. One of the things that was stated here is that we need urgency. But under our bill, urgency doesn't have to happen. Uh, in fact, the one project that we know about, uh, the next day, the planning board granted a two year extension to the Grovesner project. So this project doesn't have to be, but I hope it moves forward more quickly than that, but it doesn't have to, there's no requirement in our law. And our job is to, a stated goal of this bill was to create urgency, but you really don't have to do that here. You can wait, see what the market demands, see when people can afford to pay the highest rent on the highest cost housing in our region, and then just wait and pocket the profit. And there's nothing to stop you from doing that, uh, the way this bill was written. Um, I've heard from Montgomery County residents who support it, and I've heard as a way to support more housing. And I, I get that because it's, it's complicated and we all want that, and it sounds good. Uh, but you have to dig a little deeper here. Um, you know, as we're dealing with this economic pandemic, we just had a, a meeting this morning talking about all the money that we've gotten from the federal government and how we need more and all the needs we have. It's incumbent upon us to say, how do we make sure that we're protecting the interest of the county? And a big way to do that is our revenue stream. Um, and the idea that uh, I'm going to put, quote my uh, my good friend, and I'm, I'm a bit of a nerd on this, uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi, you know, who said only a Sith deals in absolutes. And only someone who respects the nuance and thoughtful consideration uh, is, is what you should seek to be to be a Jedi. And in this case, it's been said multiple times, and it was just kind of presented this way that, you know, we have brown fields and green fields, and there's nothing at any metro in Montgomery County, which just isn't true. There are, there, are, there are developments, they may not all, they may not all be high-rise developments, but there's significant developments and there's high-rise across the street that are, you know, doing pretty well. And there are, this project that, the one that we know about, uh, had a proposal for a different type of development and move forward before there were any subsidy. So I think we have to remember that. Um, we made a couple of proposals in the committee work sessions that I did, and it, it's interesting how this works out. You know, now it's the proposals that the amendments that passed, and I'll give you, this one is sticks out in my mind because this proves, I think, an underlying point and a problem with this bill and why we should have allowed DHCA the opportunity, as they do with normal pilots, to assess the public benefit on a case-by-case -case scenario. I proposed an amendment in committee that 25% of the 15% of MPDUs required be at 50% uh, of AMI, so folks making $60,000 a year or less, roughly. That amendment failed 4-1. I was the only one to vote for it. And the reason given was that any increase in the cost of the project, including making 18 of, a, of, uh, of the units in a 500-unit building, for 50% or less of AMI would break the deal. It would be the, the, the you know, the, the, it would break the camel's back. 4-1, and, and, and so stated by colleagues, but also 
and the economic analysis uh, that was paid for by the developer, Five Square, which said that own anything outside of the 15% NPD, you would make the project unfeasible. Then miraculously, uh, we fast forward a week or two, and it's a unanimous vote for the same amendment. No financials have changed. The proposed, no additional information was sent from the developer or their analyst. Just overnight, it, it changed, and, and now it was fine. It's important because that means we have no clue, nor have we asked, what the margins of this project are and when a developer is pocketing the extra money, we're allowing them to decide when to build it, and we're not protecting taxpayer money, in my view, and protecting the guardrails. We're subsidizing the highest cost, highest rent housing with very, very limited affordability requirements, which was my amendment. I think we should have done more for the taxpayer in this instance. Um, and current law would have allowed for that. And they say, and it was mentioned also by the bill sponsor, that this is a limited uh, targeted amendment. Just yesterday, or two days ago, the days are running together, we heard that there will be proposals coming down the pike to do this same type of thing on non WMATA property. I, I so this is not don't this is not just a one time thing. The other, the last thing I'll mention. You should residents should know that five square and the one project we know again there's another big problem here that is one project we made a policy for one project when the costs of developing all the metros are not the same, which is again why we should have allowed for analysis. Uh, by DHCA, by our Department of Housing, by Asim Nagam, who comes from Virginia, the place that we all hold up as the, as the holy grail of doing everything right, who would do a fair job in, in, in this instance. And if you don't like Mark Elrich, get in line. He's going to be here for two years, maybe. These, ta these tax credits are going to last well past Many of many of our time on the council, and maybe even some of our lives. So, we have to do what's right for the future, and allow government to do its job and kick the tires for the cost that this is going to have for our residents. The other thing is the SSP. the The fiscal analysis that was presented with this bill, and I don't think this was an accident assumed uh, the impact fees as they stand under current law. We've made decisions and are gonna make future decisions, I suspect, that lower impact, lower the uh, impact taxes in the SSP and give even more discounts to, uh, to developers for impact fees. And so you're gonna have even more tax revenue that is foregone with the combination of these policies. So I, I just think this is not prudent. Uh, we should have done it by a case, case by case scenario at a minimum allowed DHCA to kick the tires and make an assessment of the public benefit. Uh, we're making a policy, a wide scale policy with very little information. Uh, and one of the things specifically we should have done is asked for uh, some analysis on what the uh, profit revenues are. You know, if we're, if we're paying for 10% of the project, which is what we are doing, 10%, we're an investor. And all the investors in this project have the information about what the return is going to be. And the taxpayers of Montgomery County are investors. And we should set up something where once they reach a, a, a certain amount of profit, that that kicks in and then the tax subsidy goes away. It doesn't mean we don't want to incentivize it. I'm not against incentives. I'm not where the county executive is on this. But we have, in the in the trying to seek out and say, well, we throw our hands up and we're not as good as Northern Virginia and we have to do this and we have to do more and we could, we have to make a big statement. I think we're not doing our responsibility here under this bill to 
protect taxpayer dollars. And knowing that we're going to get some development as we already have Twin Brook, other places on Metro. So anyway, I, I just think uh, this is a mistake. I won't be supporting the overturn of the veto. Uh, and I appreciate the time, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Member Navarro. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm not going to belabor the point because I think we've already had a robust conversation. We took a vote uh, and a lot has been said. I just would reiterate summing up that for me, this continues to just be one more tool in our toolkit, one more opportunity for transit oriented development. Uh, some comments were made about the legislative process. That's how the legislative process is. Uh, you have committees. Sometimes you come back and you change that particular decision. I think it just something like that happened not to a couple of hours ago or something like that. So that's that's how it's done. And uh, at the end of the day, again, for me, this is a tool that we have. If we are able to realize some high rise development on our metro station, that's going to be really, really awesome. Uh, if it doesn't work in other metro stations, then it doesn't go forward. And we continue to do whatever we can to figure out how to enhance different parts of our county. But this is an opportunity. Obviously, if these things were just, you know, happening all over the place, we wouldn't be looking at this. But this has been identified as a gap. And that's what we're trying to do. So um, obviously, then I'll be voting for this override. Uh, I think that Again, we've all been on record saying why, and and uh, and, and again, want to thank uh, all the work that's gone into this uh, so far. I think the, uh, the committee did a great job in uh, being super thorough, and I think there were like I don't know, it was like eight months of deliberations or something like that. So it's not as if this was not something um, that was not uh, examined very carefully. So obviously, I'll be supporting the override. Thank you, thank you Councilmember Freed. Yeah, thank you. I'll be brief uh, as well. Uh, a lot's been said. Um, yeah, I, I think it fundamentally comes down to whether or not you believe in the social, economic, and environmental value of high-rise transit-oriented development. And you know, we have a severe housing crisis that has severely hindered our progress. And if you believe that, and you un you 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 value the inherent economic and environmental benefit from high rise development specifically as fundamental to smart growth development uh, on top of Metro, um, then this bill simply foregoes revenue we wouldn't otherwise receive to generate housing and smart growth development we desperately need in strategic locations where we desperately want. And certainly uh, if you are willing to accept mid and low rise development on these locations uh, as the type of development that we want, which is contrasting every other policy that we have made, uh, land use and environmental and economic, uh, or if you're willing to wait till the market changes, which could be 10, 15, 20, even 30 years, because it's not just Montgomery County that's struggling with this. Every jurisdiction around the region has challenges with high rise development on metro stations because of their unique infrastructure needs. Um, then we could wait and we could allow us to continue down the road that we have been, which is not meeting our environmental sustainability goals, not meeting our transit targets, not meeting our housing goals, all of which have been very aggressive and we could wait and we could not do this. Or we could begin, and this is just one small piece, as uh, Councilmember Navarro noted, one tool in our toolkit to turn some of our rhetoric into reality. And just because it won't do everything and won't solve all of our uh, challenges doesn't mean that we shouldn't start by doing something. And I think that this is something and it's significant and it will allow us to move forward on a clear goal. It's also important to note, I mean, there are just philosophical disagreements here. If you believe that having a Metro site that generates no revenue, no housing and no redeemable public benefits besides surface parking, is in the public interest, then we could continue. And if you if you believe that generating revenue from that strategic asset is a net positive, where the income taxes uh, and the impact taxes are more than the value of, of, of the benefit, then, then, then we should uh, then, then we should proceed. I think that there are legitimate views 
uh, on this. I, I'm not trying to discredit anybody. I don't think there is universal opinion on either side of it, even though we have to make binary choices here, of, you know, up or down. And I don't want to lump people together into different uh, categories uh, unfairly, but it's a question of whether foregoing something we wouldn't otherwise receive to create a benefit that we desperately want and frequently talk about is something that we want to do. I think that this moves us uh, in the right direction. I think it's one of many things that we'll need to do. It doesn't solve every problem, but it solves several problems. And uh, it certainly would be a, a net uh, positive uh, for the county. I hope that the council will uh, maintain its votes uh, from the uh, initial and override uh, this veto. And I appreciate the time, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Vice President Hucker. Um, well, colleagues, um, I think all of you know I have great respect for Councilmember Reamer and my colleague's point of view on this. Um, I just want to quickly explain my vote as well. I, I know this legislation very well intentioned. I absolutely believe in transit oriented development. As I said, I sponsored the original state bill on this and many other projects. Um, for me, just quickly, the bill is, is too sweeping to be comfortable with at this time. Um, one, we have a very uncertain budget picture at, at all levels, the federal level, the state level, the county level. Um, this might turn out to be a great idea, but there's no need necessarily to pass it right now until we know partic in particular what's gonna happen with question A and question B in our county. Um, and I believe it would be wiser to wait, regardless of the merits of the issue. Number two, um, I would have been comfortable with a more surgical approach. As, as I said, I was a co-sponsor of the original bill because I believe in the concept of it. Um, I believe there needs to be improvements to our current existing pilot program, even uh, give the ability to give 100% pilot over 15 years um, would have been up to 100% would be an improvement over our current project. Um, but not all developers and not all projects are created equally. Um, some need help from taxpayers and some don't. Um, and third, in terms of balance, if an investor um, develops at Metro, the county benefits, certainly the state also benefits and WMATA benefits. It's no surprise to me that WMATA would favor this bill um, because the county gives up revenue, but WMATA doesn't give any revenue um, from this. They just they just receive new riders and, and uh, uh, new activity. Um, I certainly don't want any Metro sites that generate no revenue and are just parking lots, um, but I think it's a little more complicated than this bill is, is based on uh, based on the um, feedback I've gotten from developers who don't want to develop at Metro for other reasons uh, aside from the tax burden. Um, again, well-intentioned people can disagree. I very much respect the work of my colleagues on this, um, and I really hope it results in smart projects and eventually revenue for the county, but at this point, I'm not comfortable um, overriding the veto. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Reno. Thank you. I'll try to be brief, and then uh, perhaps we'll We'll vote. Um, I just wanted to respond on a few points, and I, I do appreciate Councilmember Hucker's comments. I, I think, I think that I can respect, you know, I can respect a different view on this issue. Um, uh, but I do want to uh, correct a few comments that were otherwise made. Um, uh, first of all, there there is an extensive study about profitability uh, and the Grosvenor project. Um, there was a consultant hired. There's a very detailed report, and that report, which is un very unusual, but and this is a very unusual proposal, so it's warranted to provide that internal transparency about the project. And uh, so we did receive that information, and what we found was that even with the incentive, that the first big project that we are hoping to move forward, which hasn't been able to move forward despite having a development agreement since 2013 is still on the low end of profitability. And so we're hopeful that this will help them move forward. Uh, it's not a slam dunk, um, but, you know, it certainly wasn't moving forward without it. Um, I, I, I want to comment briefly on the issue of tax revenue. I think it's just, you know, Metro doesn't pay any tax revenue to the county. Its properties are tax free. And so we don't give up funding when someone develops on the property. The only scenario under which you would, I think, fairly conclude that we would be giving up money is if you believe that the development would move forward without the incentive. And I, you know, I think that is like a fair thing for people to think about and decide where they land on that. 
Um, I think the council is saying, you know, I, I forwarded around this Washington Post article from 1997. Great fanfare, Montgomery County announcing high-rise development plans for the White Flint Metro. You know, you know what's there today? Acres of grass and shrubs and vines, because it has never come. That's that big field you see right next to the White Flint Metro. Um, so we're saying we think it's not going to come. And so we're not giving up a penny because we don't collect any money. But this is actually a way to make money. This is a way to get money, to get tax revenue for the first time from these properties, um, you know, significantly. And um, uh, legislatively, um, we are not allowed to provide a pilot by legislation except on government property. A comment was made that other other property owners are going to come ask. We can't do that. That would not be legal. So there is no concern about this becoming, you know, a can of worms that we open and then it's crawling all over the place. This is uh, this is just a singular type of opportunity. Um, I, I'm I'm glad the council did support the additional provision around affordable housing. I did feel it was premature at committee to embrace that because we weren't done with the legislative process, as Council Member Navarro, I think, observed. And there was a lot more ahead of us, and so it made sense to wait until that time to make any decisions. Um, and, uh, and I'm glad that we did. So, um, you know, uh, anyway, thank you. Great, great discussion. Appreciate my colleagues' engagement and, and, and the support of those who I hope will vote to override. Thank you, Council Member Glass. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'm glad that this bill increases the amount of affordable housing on these sites. And I'm glad that we are requiring local worker preference for the crews that will help construct these buildings. But I really wish we mandated that those workers receive prevailing wage. I view that as a misstep in this process and a missed opportunity. Um, and because of that, I don't think that this is a perfect bill. Legislation isn't always a perfect process, but you know, I, I come to this as I did during the actual process itself that we have to acknowledge we're in a housing crisis and we have to acknowledge we are in an environmental crisis, which requires us to build more housing in an environmentally sustainable way. And building that housing for young families and seniors who who want to forgo their cars uh, means that we need to encourage it on transit. And there is no better place than literally on top of our metro stations. And so for that reason, I will be supporting this override, recognizing it is not the bill that I would have wished, but I am only one of nine. Uh, and so we will continue figuring out ways to make sure that uh, we grow in, in equitable ways where we support everyone in our community, those who want to live in the homes, uh, and those who help build those homes as well. Thank you, Councilmember Albernaz. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. This, you know, obviously, this feels a little bit like deja vu because we had these same conversations as we were deliberating this discussion before. Uh, and I appreciated the thoughtful comments of my colleagues then, and I appreciate them now as well. I came down on the side of feeling strongly that we need a spark, that we need to take a chance in order to create the kind of housing that everyone agrees we need. And while this bill is certainly not perfect, I do feel as though we took careful consideration into the points that were made throughout this entire process. We added the sunset provision, which I do think was significant. We added deeper affordability, which I also think was significant. And we created a local hiring preference. And to my colleague, uh, Chairman uh, Reamer's point, you know, we are talking about nine individual projects. And while I respect the comment that was made earlier, that this may open the door for similar kinds of proposals moving forward, my support for this specific bill was based on these nine specific projects. And if there are other proposals that come down the pike, I will look at those, but it's an age old fight here in Montgomery County, uh, the question of development and who pays for it. Um, but I think that at the end of the day, 
uh, that this bill in its current form, while I admit not perfect, does present a chance for that spark. Uh, and, and that, for those reasons, is why I continue to support it and support the override. So thank you, Mr. Council President. I appreciate the thoughtful deliberation that we had again here this evening. Thank you. Council Member Rice. Well, thank you very much, uh, Council President. And I'm going to be brief as well. I've already expressed why I supported this to begin with. Um, but let me just say something that does disappoint me about this process since folks have weighed in. Um, with County Executive Leggett, he very rarely vetoed a bill. But when he did, he made sure that he took the initiative to call council members and tell them why he was vetoing the bill and why he felt as though we should change our positions. I never got a call from County Executive Elrich. And so I'm wondering what would be the purpose of vetoing a bill if you never even bothered to pick up the phone to say, hey, this is what I'm thinking and why I'm really concerned about why this bill is moving forward and why I hope that you would do something else. And so for me, it's kind of an exercise in futility. It really is just a case for him to write a letter and put it in public to try and chastise and make us look bad without even talking about the very issues that are before us that we're debating that are valued on both sides of the fence. You know, and so these are the things that I think when it comes to leadership, uh, that really call into question, you know, the challenges that we face in terms of building a better relationship between the county executive and county council. And so I hope moving forward uh, that this is a signal uh, and I hope that the county executive is listening and he knows my cell phone number, um, that this is an opportunity for us to really start to build a better bridge between the county council and the county executive when it comes to issues like this. It's not always going to be we're all on the same page. And when it's not, we need to work together to make sure that we're doing things in the best interest of the county. And we can always agree to disagree, just as we do on this council. But then what we don't do is try and make it seem as though people are doing something that's wrong. Now, again, people may disagree and feel that there's a better way to do something. And that's what I think that my colleagues here have espoused today. You've heard very different opinions in terms of how it is we think we can go about achieving the very you know, uh, procedures and processes and objectives that we want to see. But at the same time, um, we don't do that while disparaging each other, saying that, oh, well, you know, they're in the pockets of developers or they're only, you know, socialists or you don't hear any of that rhetoric. And so I'm just I'm, I'm so concerned about how it is we move forward from this. And I hope that we find ourselves in a better place as a body, because where we are right now is not healthy. It's not healthy for the county. It's not healthy for our residents. It's not healthy for the tax base that's out there who expect nothing but the best for Montgomery County. So thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Um, let me just say that I too am going to vote to override the veto. Uh, this is far from a perfect bill. I said that in the very beginning. I say that at the very end. Um, I believe that candidly, that of all the groups that gain from this, that WMATA gains more than anybody because WMATA is is getting a, a, uh, a very good deal for a piece of property that they would have had to pay prevailing wage on if they built. And that's why I voted for the prevailing wage amendment. It did not pass, but that's why for this piece of property, because I felt WMATA was sidestepping their obligation by, by leasing the property, not selling it, they're leasing it. Uh, I believe the developer gains, and I'm not opposed to profits. I, I certainly was a retailer. I understand trying to make a profit, and, and I'm certainly not opposed to that. But I believe the developer gains from this as well. But the bottom line is the people who will be living in that building gain the most. They will gain access to, to Metro, and hopefully Metro will come back uh, to the, to the uh, place that it was and beyond be, before COVID. But the, the people that will live there will be living in a very nice building. And of course, it's been pointed out many times, we don't get taxes now and we don't. And th the reality is this is more than about money. We don't get taxes now, but we will get income tax from the people living in there. So we'll gain something in 15 years. For, for those of you who have a little bit of age, so you know how fast 15 years happens. And that will happen in a hurry. We'll start to get some property tax from this piece of property as well. But the bottom line is this is more rather than about taxes, rather than about the dollars, this is about the perception. 
And this is saying that Montgomery County, who's had issues, whether it's fair or unfair, and candidly, it's probably unfair that we're not business friendly, but people want to believe it. And once they say it, they somebody else says it, and they say, well, I heard that as well. And therefore, that 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 snowball takes effect. The bottom line is this is about the perception that Montgomery County is open for business, that Montgomery County will stay with what they have suggested and what they will do. And as I say, this is not a perfect bill. We're not going to ever have a perfect bill for this. But I believe that this is the right thing to do to override this veto. I respect the county executive for his his uh, his belief. I believe he could have uh, not he could have uh, let this go into uh, into uh, as become legislative law by by uh, just being a pocket area and saying I'm not going to sign it, but I'll, I'll let it go into effect. He didn't do that. He brought out his thoughts, and and I respect him for that. But the bottom line is that we need to do what we said we would do. I haven't changed my mind on it, and I think no one else on this on this call, including the county executive has changed their mind as well. So with that, we have a motion by Council Member Reamer. We have a second by Council Member Friedson. All those in, and I'm, let me just ask. Uh, uh, this this is a roll call. I was going to ask, Mr. Drummer, you read my mind, which is very dangerous <laughs> for me and you, might I add. Uh, but so with that, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mr. Glass. Yes. Mr. Glass votes yes. Mr. Tawando. No. Mr. Tawanda votes no. Mr. Reamer. Yes. Mr. Reamer votes yes. Ms. Navarro. Yes. Ms. Navarro votes yes. Mr. Albanos. Yes. Mr. Albanos votes yes. Mr. Rice. Yes. Mr. Rice votes yes. Mr. Friedson. Yes. Yes. Mr. Friedson votes yes. Mr. Hucker. No. Mr. Hucker votes no. Mr. Katz. Yes. So it carries seven to two, the same vote as the first as the first time this uh, was passed. So the the, uh, the uh, veto is now overridden. Thank you all very, very much for, for having the good discussion. And, I, and as we have proven once again, we have proven once again, we can disagree agreeably. And we've done it time and time again. I have a feeling we'll do it a few other times, probably soon. But we can do that and continue to work together because we are here with differences of opinion in many, in some cases, we are here to see that Montgomery County is, it gets the, the best legislation, the best that it can be. So thank you very much. And with that, I know this is going to be very sad to my colleagues, but this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you.